everyone. My name is Jake, and welcome to the 14th episode of Good Timing. As always on this podcast, we're going to be talking all about one of our favorite bands, the Beach Boys. And today we've got a pretty cool show in store for you all because we're going to be doing our first member spotlight episode. So on these episodes, we're going to be focusing in on a specific member of the band and discussing their life and musical career. Um, so as I'm sure you could all tell uh, from the title of this episode, today's member spotlight is on everyone's favorite rhythm guitarist, Al Jardine. Uh, so Al, of course, is one of the founding members of the Beach Boys. Um, he's played on nearly all of their studio albums. And uh, from the beginning, he has been a big part of the band's overall sound, both in the studio and on stage. Um, he has also sang lead vocals on many songs over the years, uh, most famously on Help Me Rhonda, um, but also on tracks like Cotton Fields, uh, I Know There's an Answer, Honkin' Down the Highway, uh, Lady Linda, Come Go With Me, and From There to Back Again. Um, and his backing vocals can be heard prominently on many other songs as well. Uh, Al is also known as being the most folk-influenced member of the group because that was the kind of music that he listened to and played growing up. Um, and he brought some of that influence to the Beach Boys. Uh, Al was the one who suggested to Brian that the Beach Boys record the old folk song Sloop John B, um, which he helped kind of rework the song to help fit the Beach Boys sound. Um, and you can also hear Al's folk influence on tracks like At My Window and Looking at Tomorrow, which, uh, of course, both borrow from older folk songs that Al listened to. Um, so uh, lastly, Al has always been known as one of the most clean cut and personable members of the group. Uh, of course, we all know the expression, keep it clean with Al Jardine. Uh, and to me, he's always come off as just a really friendly and down to earth guy who just happens to have been a part of one of the greatest and most popular bands of all time. So um, joining me for today's episode, I have Riley and our special guest, Nate, uh, who is a huge Beach Boys fan and also a guitarist and musician himself. Uh, Nate also has his own YouTube channel where he posts a lot of different musical content, including videos on the Beach Boys and Jan and Dean. So we will provide a link to that in the description of this episode. So you can all check it out. Uh, so I'm really Thanks looking for forward to, of course. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to discussing Al's life and musical career with you guys. I feel like he's always been one of the most underrated and overlooked members of the band, and I'm glad that we're covering him today. So uh, before we begin, do you guys have any quick general thoughts or things you just want to say about Al and his role in the Beach Boys? Um, One thing that stands out just based on your uh, bio there, I really love that you said that something about Al that stands out is in a beautiful way. He's like a normal guy who happens to be in one of the most famous rock bands of all time, whereas pretty much all the other members have their prima donna moments and their like questionable I'm a celebrity kind of type moments. Al uh, is really just like a normal guy that happened to be in America's band. So he has like a very unique perspective and like role within the group for that reason. So I love that way of looking at it. Uh, Riley, you have anything you want to say? Um, I mean, he he's probably like, like you guys have said, he's the clean cut member. He's very relatable. I mean, as a musician too, like he's kind of influenced some of my playing, mostly like my rhythmic styles. I mean, I could probably bring it up later, but there is like a specific like technique he uses when he does play rhythm. Me that too. I, yeah. That I use where, I mean, I'll, I'll just say like, hold on. <laughs> so when he has, um, when he's doing like the little like power chord rhythm, I mean, I'm using my 12 string, so it doesn't sound as good, but like most people will go like pointer finger and ring finger. I just, I, he goes pointer finger and middle finger, which is a bit of a stretch which is like really weird and uncomfortable at first, but it's made a lot of my rhythms a lot easier to like just do. Cause you can also have a lot more like flexibility with your pinky, which is something that you kind of see him doing a lot like live on stage. And I, I mean, I just take a lot of like inspiration from that, but he's like probably the most skilled string instrumentalist in the group. I mean, I know Carl was pretty good at guitar. I know David Marks kind of went on to be like a really fantastic guitar player, but I mean, Al, Al was doing like a lot of the bass stuff from a, uh, Little Deuce Coop onwards instead of Brian. And he does a lot of guitar work with the band. So he's just a very skilled instrumentalist that I, I think kind of goes unrecognized in the band. So I, absolutely so overlooked as an instrumentalist. Because he's, he's doing like the stand up, he did the stand up bass on the original surfing recording, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's just super, super talented guy. He has a very great voice. Um, and he's just an overall really nice guy. I mean, even though he kind of sided with Mike on a lot of like the band's decisions in the late seventies, I mean, I, I still think that it doesn't really like do any harm to like how good of a person he was. And he was always kind of like there for Brian. I know like after 
Carl died, he left the group out of like an integrity and you just didn't think it was the Beach Boys anymore. But you, you see him touring with Brian in the 2010s. I mean, just a really fantastic guy. I, I love Al. Yeah, fantastic guy. And like you guys said, just like super talented. Uh, like you said, um, not only did he play rhythm guitar, but he also played bass. You hear his bass playing on quite a few of the early recordings, I believe, like pre like 65, like around like today and before. Um, also great vocalist. They covered Brian's parts in concert uh, uh, for many years and just did an amazing job covering some really difficult vocals, uh, you know, that Brian obviously did so well on the studio albums, but Al did a great job doing them live. Uh, listening to Al sing a song like Heroes and Villains Live is just awesome. Um, and then also, of course, also has written some great songs as well. Uh, I've made it clear on this podcast before. One of my favorite songs by the Beach Boys is All This Is That and Al uh, mm -hmm. co-wrote song and i just i absolutely love it so for that alone i love al but uh he just uh, i feel like like i said a very overlooked member of the band that really contributed a lot and uh today we're kind of going to give him his due and uh talk a bit about him and hopefully you guys uh listening can learn something new about him so um i guess to start us off nate do you kind of want to go into al's early years before the beach boys and kind of what led him to eventually become one of the founding members of the band sure so al is originally from small town called Lima, Ohio. And he was only there um, for a couple of years, um, probably through like a toddler kindergarten age, lived in Rochester, New York for a while. And before he finally moved uh, to Southern California, where he'd attend Hawthorne High School and eventually El Camino College where Brian Wilson also went to school. And Al was, like you mentioned, particularly influenced by the folk music scene and by particularly the Kingston Trio. And so he picked up the acoustic guitar and the ukulele from a folk music perspective. Uh, whereas Carl Wilson and David Marks fell in love with R&B and rock music, Al fell in love with folk music. And if I recall correctly, uh, Al became aware of the Wilson brothers' musical abilities through um, Brian and Carl performing at school, what's the word, assemblies, at school assemblies. And so Al and Brian became acquaintances and they played on the football team together at Hawthorne High School. And there's the infamous story where through a mishap that happened on the field, one thing led to another. And through some action of Brian's, Al ends up breaking his leg during the football game when they were in high school together. And uh I'm no football a, expert, so I, I don't am. think I could. All right, there we go. Yeah, you can. All right, it was a, it problem. was. He's supposed. To, I think it was a. I read it somewhere. He's supposed to pitch left, which means that the quarterback hikes the ball. He's supposed to go this way, but instead he put went this way, pitched it, and then I guess Al kind of got confused and he ran between two of the guys, and that's how he broke his broke his. I think his arm or his femur, right? Right. And, yeah. And um, that's a that's a very real thing that happens in football is like getting confused on which way the play will go. I so I can totally see how Al <laughs> broke his uh, broke his arm. And yes, it, yeah, it really sounds like something Brian would do is just get those things confused. I can kind of see why Brian was the backup quarterback. So. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then they reunite um, at during their college years at El Camino College, and. Uh, Al asked Brian if he wants to jam and make some music. And Brian has a few brothers. And, you know, from there, it's almost too easy to say the rest is history. Uh, but pretty quickly, uh, their jams developed into their early songs that became the hits that we all know and love. But as far as this early stage still goes, uh, the guys needed instruments and there's two stories about how they acquired the instruments. Uh, there's the way the Wilson brothers tell the story is that they, uh, 
got some money for food from their parents while their parents were away in Mexico and they used the money to buy the instruments. But there's also the way that Al Jardine remembers it where they spent that money on whatever. And so they needed to audition for Al's mom to lend them the money to buy the instruments. So the way Al tells the story is they were in his living room singing for Al's mom and they sang surfing for her. And, you know, she was maybe tapping her foot. She was maybe a little impressed, but, but Al recognized that, that they needed something a little bit more substantial to perform f- for her. So they busted out an early uh, iconic Beach Boy acapella arrangement of Their Hearts Were Full of Spring by the four freshmen. And that sold Al's mom on lending them the money to get their first instruments, which was, you know, their genesis as a band. So that's definitely an important step in their development and a, you know, a summary of, of Al's early years and sort of introduction to the group and the fold. I'm not really sure which, uh, which like story to believe. Cause I mean, I feel like the, um, the, the parents giving them money and then them spending it sounds like it'd be a lot cooler, but I mean, I also kind of feel like that's more of like a storybook kind of story where it, that was, I was, I know that was used. And I think, uh, what was that nineties? Um, American TV family. Show? Yeah, I mean that, that that lines up a lot better with that kind of thing. I feel like if they just showed him like auditioning for Al's mom, that, that would be a bit like less what's the word like entertaining. But I mean, I don't know. I feel yeah, like it's a little bit like, more rock and roll, punk <laughs> kind of like to yeah. to I use feel like there's um use the parents' money than it was to like sit auditioning for the parents. That's a good point. I feel like there's like some. I, I don't know. Though I think both are believable. Though I mean. Most of the kids, most of the guys in the group are still in like in high school. So I mean, that's yeah. I think it's, that. If my parents gave me like it's also dollars. I would probably spend it on a guitar. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible that that both stories are true, and maybe they were able to get one or two instruments with the money from Murray and Audrey, and maybe they had to get the other two or three from Al's mom, or you know, and they only remember what sticks out to them. That, that's but anyway, fair. instruments are expensive and i feel like just like a week's worth yeah, of right. money isn't really enough yeah. to get you like fender a band's worth and, of instruments yeah and amps and all that yeah that's that'd be nuts so they uh they practice their little hearts out we all know the story that murray and audrey get home from their trip and uh you know they left their sons and they return and there's a rock band in the house, you know, and, but, you know, Murray being the musician that he was, he did have an ear for some music and recognized the boys talents and hooked them up with a local producer, Height Morgan. And they recorded surfing and surfer girl and surfing safari and a couple other songs with them, which was enough to get them signed to Capitol. And while this whole process was going on, Al's parents were having like some serious second doubt, second thoughts and doubts on Al's ability to turn this into a career. So I think, you know, his parents' line of thinking as it related to this, maybe even rightfully so, started to uh, shed on to Al's way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so Al decides to go to college and can just continue his studies instead of continuing with the group. And this happens before they uh, sign with Capitol. So the five signatures on their original Capitol Records contract were the Wilson brothers, Mike and David Marks, actually. Um, So they record their first two albums without Al, Um, you know, that all happens so quick. It happens in less than a year's time. And, you know, during this time, Brian Wilson is writing the majority of the songs, singing on them, arranging, playing the bass, concerts, studio. It all gets to be too much. And Brian invites Al 
originally back just for the concerts to fill in for Brian on stage. Uh, but of course, Brian and Al were friends. Brian knew how talented Al was instrumentally and vocally. So pretty quickly, he was back in the fold in the studio too. And he his contributions right off the bat with his return for the Surfer Girl album really like elevate the musicality of of the performances uh they like the rhythm section and just like the backing tracks in general on surf and safari and surf in usa are a bit like quaint i'd say um or like gentle sounding and when you throw al in the mix his really solid bass playing and guitar playing instantly elevates the instrumental sound and having Al return to the vocal harmony blend also allows them to start doing a lot more complex vocal arrangements. So Al's like immensely important role to the band is immediately observable with that surfer girl album and the rest going forward yeah i definitely think that the first two albums with like david marks on rhythm i mean i think david does a great job on rhythm guitar it definitely has that driving force behind it but it's a lot more garage rock on those first two albums than it is like actual like pop music that you hear on surfer girl onwards um I think yeah that, yeah like i mean if you like i like garage rock i feel like it works for a lot of songs like i mean there's the famous cover of the kingsman doing louis louis like that's like the best example of it where like that primitive sound really works and it drives the song but i mean for what the band was doing with surfer girl i mean that that's a lot more pop oriented you have a lot of those ballads on that album and i think david's like driving rhythm guitar doesn't really work for that um david always yeah, you wonder like if if al's return to the group had a bigger impact than most people realize on on the band's like transition to more pop oriented songwriter oriented stuff sort of away from like the the garage rock that um that really in hindsight it seems like david marks like like you've said was really influencing yeah and i i feel like i mean brian brian did does just fine on the bass like i, I don't think he's like a terrible bass player but I mean, like a lot of those, like like Surfer Girl, Surfer Girl, like the song itself and the album is like a lot more pristine and like clean cut. I mean, you kind of need that like almost session like bass player than Brian Wilson's just like thumping on the strings. I mean, you need somebody who really like knows the instrument well rather than Brian, who is more of a piano player and a vocalist than just like a regular bass player. You you need that. You needed. You kind of needed Al on that record and little little Deuce Coop and a lot of the stuff onwards. Yeah, really for me, one of the, I'm so thrilled that we're getting the opportunity to talk about this um, because one of the defining aspects for me of the Beach Boys like hit sound um, is Al's bass playing. And if you go through, let's say like the Endless Summer track listing or Sounds of Summer track listing, like any Beach Boys greatest hits package, Al played bass on really like the majority of their hits and the majority of their 63 to 66, let's call it output. Um, I was playing bass all over those albums. And with Brian playing the bass, like you pointed out, he plays with his thumb and often with his other fingers, like wrapped around the back side of the neck. And you have the, um, you have the tug bar. I, 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 mean, I play the same bass the same way as Brian, but you, he used the tug bar, but I got to admit sometimes that's not really like, an accurate way of playing, especially when you get to that faster material. It works really yeah. well when you're going boom, boom, boom. But when you're going to like, so like a song like I Get Around, it doesn't really work as well. Right. And so, um, yeah, I think Brian's definitely a, a, a great bassist in his own right. But yeah, so Brian played with that thumb technique. Um, and Al played the bass differently. Al as far as I know, always played with a pick and a combination of, of playing with a pick and muting, palm muting the bass strings. And it's just like immediately noticeable on songs like particularly Catch a Wave, 
I would say is almost like the definitive surf bass sound that Fender P bass being plucked and muted. It, it gives like a, a very like sharp attack to the bass on stuff like uh, Catch a Wave, Fun, 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 I Get Around that like gives the whole arrangement like more oomph and more like energy and sparkle than Brian's like thumb technique. And like instantly, once you have Al's bass playing, it's like another one of those classic Beach Boy elements falls into place. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, so, do, you, do you know for do you know if he played the six string uh the Fender six on the uh on I Get Around or no? I've got uh, so Al didn't, but uh, Ray Pullman. No, no, no. Sorry, Al and I. So it's one of two things. Um, it was either so Al's for sure on the on the four string precision, and it's Glenn Campbell and Ray Pullman are also playing bass. I think it's most likely Glenn Glenn and Ray both playing the six strings. Um, the Dan Electro six strings, which yeah. are you know basically the same as the Fender six. Yeah. But it could have been Glenn. It could have been one of them on a four string and. Or, you know, it could have been Al and one of the Wrecking Crew guys on a four string and one six string. But there's definitely a six string bass on that for sure. Yeah, because there's like there's like so many different like accounts for what the bass line on that song is. Like if you like I, I've done like so many like I've literally put in hours listening to like the session tapes from that 2014 like box set. of Me too, I'm yeah. Around. And I'm like trying to like dissect the song because I mean, it's my favorite song of all time and I want to learn how to play it. Like I have like all the guitar parts down and just like figuring out the bass line. It's like, there's so many different like things it could be. And I feel like there being more than one bass player makes a lot of sense for that. So. Yeah, there's definitely multiple bass lines, so to speak. Yeah. Which is, you know, like, like almost like incomprehensible in most composition methods and most other artists. But yeah, with Brian, he just did it so seamlessly that and pulled it off so well that um a lot of those like mid 60s songs have like al or carl plus a few wrecking crew guys and one particular gal on bass that you know so it can be it can be a real mind trip trying to transcribe those parts but like whatever whatever bass line al was playing though it's it's a hard bass line if you ever look at it it's like yeah I, totally it's it's like it's nuts it's not even like this like the technique is just like a fast song and then you have the key changes and then you have like a different bass line going on during the solo it's nuts and, and like kind of shows a lot of al's musicianship there like just as like a bassist in general but it's that's a, that's a tough song to play yeah uh speaking of, of al's of the sound of his bass playing another track that stands out to me from this era would be merry christmas baby uh which starts with just the the done the done the done of of al kind of laying down the groove that the song then builds upon but yeah if i was pointing out the particular sound of al's playing i would point to that uh merry christmas baby and i get around too um so yeah so really al returns to the group uh wearing a few different hats so so he's already returned to his spot in the harmonies uh like riding a bike you know and in the studio he's mostly playing playing bass but there's still quite a few songs in this time where brian's picking up the bass and al's playing guitar so al's like a, a you know a genuine multi-instrumentalist uh during this time for the band and it's cool because uh on the more guitar centric songs you may have had Carl and Al or Carl and David and Al playing the guitars and Brian on the bass. But then having another bass player allows Brian to play more pianos and organs and different instruments. So their whole palette is expanded by having another bassist in the group. Um, so Al's playing instrumentally singing and then on stage, He's the rhythm guitarist, and like Jake mentioned, singing a lot of Brian Wilson's parts, too. Um, 
And then you finally get to 1965. And no, I made yeah. a mistake. I was going to say Al's first lead was 65, but really it was 64. Christmas album. What is that called? Christmas Day. Day Christmas yeah. Day or on Christmas Day? Just Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I think a lot of us tend to think of Al's singing voice as like a, a great rock and roll voice. And a lot of the songs that Al sort of got handed to sing were more rock and roll type of songs. But Al's vocal debut is that Christmas Day, which is kind of very much like a jazz song. Yeah, it does sound very different from a lot of Al's other lead vocals. And I actually I really do like that song a lot. Um, I think it's a great first song for Al to sing lead on and a good way to like kind of introduce his voice to the public. Obviously, on future songs like Help Me Rhonda, he doesn't have that same sound, but uh, I think it's a, gr a good first track for sure to have a lead on. Do you have a do you have a better genre name than I, I threw out jazz just because of the two fives and stuff? But is there anything you'd call it more than Riley than than? Uh... I'd have to re-listen to the track because I mean after like. Uh... Little Saint Nick and um, what's the other like famous one? Um, Man, uh, Man, Man with all the toys. Besides, and I minus those two, I kind of blend a lot of those like Christmas tracks together. I mean, I only listen to that album in December. I mean, maybe sure, sure. like a week or two, and then I kind of get tired of it because it's like the only Christmas album that I really listen to. But um, I if I remember correctly, I, I might give it like a swing sound rather than like a yeah a yeah because it, it's like it's like the one that goes like it's like and we'll wait the whole year through. Did to make someone happy like you it's like very yeah i kind of agree with that yeah it's got i think some it's nice like swing. six chords and yeah yeah it's 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 not necessarily jazz in the way that uh giant yeah, steps it, is but it's uh <laughs> in jazz informed or jazz influenced in the way more a freshman modern harmony kind of yeah. thing but uh i mean if i remember correctly i think the christmas album had a um, who uh, the actual guy who like Dick helped reynolds the, the guy yeah who helped yeah. arrange the forest freshman stuff like like in the background helping out. So, I mean, it, it's definitely more of that, that's that swing than straight up, like straightforward jazz. But I feel like a lot of the, like the influence for that album, especially with the sound comes from like that 1940s, like swing music rather than jazz, but, but swing is a, like a version of jazz. So it's to call it jazz. Wouldn't be wrong. Yeah. Sort of that, like, uh, post almost post jazz heyday when it became the watered down sort of Sinatra like that, like, version. Kind of like that big band swing rather. Yeah. Than... Yeah. Um, so anyway, what a, what a cool debut for Al. Um, yeah. And it, some, so many people, including myself really thought that was a Brian Wilson vocal until learning otherwise. And um, you can tell Al was still sort of finding his own voice. And when you get to the following year and Al finally gets to sing, help me Rhonda twice. And uh, then I kissed her. There's like that classic Al Jardine voice that he still has to this day. When you can tell he just found like the sweet spot for his range. So this makes me want to ask you guys, which version of Help Me Rhonda do you guys prefer? Oh boy. Um, so we we've discussed this multiple times on our podcast. So the majority of us, I think pretty much all of us except Riley, uh, prefer the Summer Days version. Um, but yeah. the single version that was number one. But uh Riley prefers the today version. So uh Riley, you kinda want to explain why you prefer that version? You had to rub it in my face that the single version hit number one. I did. <laughs> well, I think it hit number one for a reason, but Go ahead. I mean, I like both versions. It's the, it's the same song at its core. And then, like, if I heard, like, the Summer Days version, like, on my Beach Boys playlist, because I have both on there. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, turn it off and, like, go to the Today version. But if I have to, like, pick one out, like, on my Spotify playlist, like, I want to listen to Help Me Rhonda right now. I'm going to the Today version. And um, I don't know. I feel like the loose atmosphere in, like, Al's rocking voice just fit the song a lot better than this, like, tightly arranged piece that's on Summer Days. I really like that loose, kind of like messy, like backing track to the song. But lately, this past month, and I, I remember I sent Jake this a while back. There's a guy on YouTube who uh, mixed the both together, so you kind of have that. Um, oh, cool! That ha that has the summer days like baseline, which I I do love that baseline. That baseline rips, but it mixes it together so well. 
And then once you get to that chorus, it kind of has that like messy, rocking, looser nature as the backing track from the Beach Boys Today version. So I've been listening to the, that a lot. I like ripped that from YouTube and I have it on my Spotify playlist now. But um, if I if you had to give me the choice between the two, I'm going the Today version. I just like that like looser sound to it rather than the Brian's like tight arrangements. But I can see why the, the tight arrangement one hit number one. I understand it. I like both. And Help Me Run is my 10th favorite Peach Boys song, so. Yeah, I think, Riley, you said the only part you don't care for in the Today version is when it, like, fades out at the end for some reason. Oh, I love reason. that part. I love yeah, that oh, part. You, oh, you do like that? Okay. Oh, my yeah, God. That's uh, like, I, it feels like it's like this song's about to come down, and then it comes right back into full force. I love it. Nate, do you know any background behind that? Like, why the yeah. song, like, fades out towards the end and then comes back in? Because, like, the first time I heard that, I was very confused by it. Like, why? Like, I, I think... Was like, I think, and I I read this like a um, in one of the you know the million books about them, but I'm pretty sure, uh, it was basically this was like when Brian started smoking weed, and I think he was like a little stoned when they were doing the mix down, and I think it probably like dawned on him that it would maybe be pretty funny to like, psych the listener out almost with like those sort of fake fade outs, yeah, and I think it was almost like maybe one of the first examples of him just letting himself be like really goofy or <laughs> like letting that sort of like loose, imperfect, imperfect, like just sort of silliness kind of seep its way into their music. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't think it was any sort of like technical thought put much into it. I think it was, it was just Brian being uh, kind of silly, but um, also the Beatles, had uh, eight days a week in the charts, uh, just roughly around the time that the Beach Boys were doing this. And eight days a week was the first pop song or maybe first record in general to have a fade in. So maybe Brian was trying to one up that and work in quite a few fades into a song. <laughs> but um, yeah, for for that reason, I sort of used to like boycott the the Today version. Because they used to bug me, those fade outs and stuff. Yeah. But, um, in honor of of this being like the year of of the Endless Summer anniversary, um, I've just been listening to Endless Summer a lot. And that's the version that's on the Endless Summer album. And so hearing it like in that context, um, sort of like made me like warm up to a little bit warm up to it a little bit and there's something that my mom said that i think is kind of interesting and so my mom is not like a musician like at all like she wouldn't have like any musical knowledge to articulate these thoughts but so she grew up with endless summer and she loves endless summer and for a while we had sounds of summer cd in her car and Sounds of Summer has the 45 version of Help Me Rhonda and Be True to Your School. And my mom would complain and say, where are the happy versions? And I would always laugh and be like, what does she mean by the happy versions? But then I went back and listened to the album versions of Help Me Rhonda and Be True to Your School. And just sort of like the loose, like more like acoustic, gentle nature of both of those versions they are kind of like the happy versions and I do sort of know what she means now in hindsight. So I sort of like have appreciation for both of those versions now with that like mind frame of looking at them. Yeah. My dad had a CD copy of endless summer that we would listen to a lot when I was a kid. And that that's part of the reason why I really like the today version a lot more. Cause I, I grew up with it a bit, but I can kind of, that's what, that's what I meant though. When I said, I prefer that version, it feels like a bit like, the looser structure to it just kind of like makes it like a happier song and I can kind of like dig it a lot more, but I still like both versions. I see like a really strong parallel between um, today and rubber soul. Like, I feel like they're both like capture like the same moment for both of those groups, like that they were both sort of like getting a little psychedelic and a little like influenced by folk music and that version of Help Me Rhonda definitely is like a reflection of the times for sure.
and that like atmosphere that was going on in 1965. Yep. Both are both are my both today and Robert Soul are my favorite albums from each band. So I feel like that makes a lot more sense. Nate, I was gonna oh, ask there we go. on the um the single version you said that your mom had of those two songs. For, so you said for Be True to Your School it was the album version that was on there or the single version? Yeah. The, the album, album version. version. See, I so for that song, I actually do prefer the album version because I'm not a huge fan of the single version because I don't like the Honey's vocals on it. I find them a little annoying. Um, yeah, that's, so, I hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, I got uh, one thing I just wanted to mention real quick, just just to kind of address it because it's something that's been said by a lot of people, but apparently it's not true. So when Al left the band, um, there's this misconception that I always believed to be true as well until like the past year or so that uh, Al left to focus on dental school. But apparently that's not actually the case because Al did not even apply to dental school until 1964. And he says that the reason that he left was actually due to creative differences and his belief that uh, the group was not going to be successful commercially. And he was just kind of concerned about the future of the group. Like he didn't know if this was something that was going to be like sustainable, you know, like a lot of groups at that time, you know, you might have a couple hits, but then you kind of just fade out to obscurity. So I kind of think that that played a role in it as well, you know, uh, according to Al. But um, have you heard that as well, uh, Nate? Yeah, that's like specifically sort of why I left out the the dental school aspect of describing his younger days is because that myth has sort of been dispelled. Um, mm -hmm. I I think I've I've been heard it told that maybe that was going to be his career path, and but he only made it as far as as gen eds um but i think we all can agree that that the world is much better place for al becoming the world renowned singer and guitarist <laughs> over the local yeah. hawthorne dentist <laughs> i wanted to i want to mention like we, we were watching rudolph the red nose reindeer like uh, in december and, I'm, and then i see the guys like i want to be a dentist and i see like just <laughs> The, the first thing that came to mind was Al, and then I see the the face of the elf. I'm like, holy shit, that that's like totally Al. I've seen. Well, it's funny because I was I was double checking his towns that he grew up in, and his official IMDb bio notes that he has an elf like appearance. Yeah. I thought that was funny to include on someone's official biography. You, you better cut that into the episode because that, that was like that was like an epiphany moment for me. <laughs> that's so. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've seen a meme or something with that with the picture of that of that elf with with that like said, that said like keep it clean with Al or something. I forgot. Yeah. I, I definitely have seen that reference before. That's very funny. But that, that that was that was like I was like what the fuck, and then like everybody in, in like the living room was looking at me. I'm like, um, you guys wouldn't get it. And like in my head, I'm just like comparing the two. It was so funny. So, um, heading out of 1965 that we were talking about with today and summer days and I guess party for that matter where you have Al singing times are changing uh you get to 66 and Al really becomes even more crucial to the band in the years prior Al and David and I don't mean this in any sort of offensive way. I'm a huge fan of both of those guys, but they were a little bit sort of like interchangeable. Um, like you could have put Al or David in each other's place for most of the early albums and, and it probably wouldn't have been that different. But you get to 1966 and Al's influence becomes a lot more pronounced. And so with Pet Sounds... Al's big contribution there was suggesting to Brian that the band did a version of Sloop John B. Uh, this actually happened during possibly the end of the Summer Days sessions um, or like during a sort of gray period between Summer Days era and Pet Sounds era. But nonetheless, Al had been a big Kingston Trio fan for years and loved the song and thought that Brian would be able to do something cool with it. And Brian obviously was very inspired. So you have Al uh, really inspiring and bringing to life in some respects 
one of the band's like biggest records of all time, one of their most famous recordings. And originally, Al didn't receive any type of uh, co-writer's credit or co-producer's credit for this. But uh, fortunately, I think that's started to become remedied in the past few years. Mm -hmm. um, he sort of has tossed that bone now, and I think given uh, co-arrangement credit or co-writer's credit when that song is released these days. Something interesting that I read about that song about Sloop John B is that so like when Brian, when it was first, when Al first presented it to Brian, Brian wasn't really that interested in doing it initially. Um, but then Al was like, you know, I'm going to try this again. So I think Al changed some chords around. He made it a little more complex than it was. Cause I think initially the original song by like the, uh, the original folk song that like the Kingston trio did, I think it's only like a three chord song I read. And I think Al said something like, you know, that wasn't going to do it for Brian. So Al made a couple of like changes to it to make it a little more complex, a little more unique. And he brought it yep. back to Brian. And then sure enough, I think he said like the next day he came to the studio and, and Brian was uh, working on it. And Al has said that like, he was blown away by what Brian did with the song. And I mean, we've mentioned this before on this podcast, but if you listen to those original versions, like by like the Kingston trio, like back to back with the beach boys version, it's unbelievable what Brian did with it. I feel like it really showcases how Brian could take a song and just make it just like incredible in terms of the production and the arrangement. It's just amazing what he did with it. Yeah. It's I mean, so amazing. It's, it's, he took a extremely simple folk song and mm -hmm. made it something that is it pop no not really is it rock no not really is is it psychedelic uh maybe a little bit but it's mm -hmm. just completely its own thing and it's timeless yeah it was one of those like beach boy songs that before i really got into the band it was one of the ones that i knew like directly from the band i didn't know any other version i remember i think i saw the band in like 2014 2015 with my family when we were in boston and like I just remember Mike Love on stage, like, here's yet another one from the Pet Sounds album. And then it just goes, <laughs> din, 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 din. and like, that was one of the ones that really clicked with me at first. I mean, I don't think I listen to it too much nowadays, but the arrangement's really genius. Um, I really like the guitar riff, the, din, 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 and I think there's two guitar riffs going on at once. Um, and even though it still like retains most of that, like, if you really look at the song Bare Bones, like that simple, like, chord structure, it's, it does show, does show Brian's genius and, and I guess even Al's genius, because I guess he played a pretty mm -hmm. big part in that. Yeah. Yeah, and then you also have Al singing a lead vocal, co-lead vocal on I Know There's an Answer, uh, which is another song that I would have sworn was Brian and was surprised to find out was Al. And uh, so you go through the next couple albums, uh, The Smile, Sessions, and which I think Al was definitely, I think Al, Bruce, and Mike, you could say, were in the camp that felt uncomfortable, sort of by the, let's say, like the, by the conduct during the smile sessions. Yeah. I think it's a bit of a, I think people jump to a conclusion that uh, Mike and Bruce and Al hated smile or disliked smile or were, were a opposed to smile musically um because all the evidence shows that they they sung their asses off on those sessions and um even like heroes and villains that is sort of a a composite of like a brian lead vocal and al lead vocal and like a mike lead vocal mm -hmm. um so al's vocal kind of definitely cuts through on the smiley smile version but I sort of brought uh, Al up in that camp as it relates to Smile and Smiley Smile because his contributions, I feel like, are a little bit more low-key on those albums. And there's a couple songs during this whole Smile era that uh, Al's just, like, not on or wasn't around for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can just understand that, um, you know, Al and Brian had been friends since childhood. And this is when Brian's health was beginning to go downhill, partially due to like the decisions he was making during that time. Um, and so you can understand why someone like Al would was getting like a little, let's just say like weirded out or concerned or 
skeptical, like having mixed emotions. And so Al kind of pulls back for those couple albums. But you get to Friends in 1968, which is uh, really what I think of as like the beginning of the era where Al is like one of the band's like heavy hitters and like one of the true MVPs that was keeping the band afloat during that time. Um, I'm just going to get an actual number, but really I think Al basically co-wrote, I want to say like a majority of friends. Yeah. I feel like but, it's at, uh, least, at least half of the tracks. I feel like it's quite a few. Yeah, yeah. So on a song of a dozen albums, I mean, sorry, on an album of a dozen songs, mm -hmm. Al wrote one, two, three, four, five. So, yeah, but Al wrote, you know, half of, co wrote half of Friends. And I really think like so much of the reason why Friends sounds the way it does is definitely Al's influence. I That's think Brian clearly like oversaw the album's production mm -hmm. but brian has kind of always been someone that needed a collaborator um or that benefited immensely from having a collaborator i think like those early beach boy albums are the sound of brian and mike kind of working like this and uh smile is the sound of brian and van dyke parks and I really think Al sort of filled the the void that Mike left by being in India during the making of Friends. I think if Al, I mean, sorry, if Mike was was at home in L.A., he'd probably have written most of Friends with Brian. But since Al was, I mean, since Mike was in India, you had Al sort of filling that void and writing most of the lyrics on Friends. Uh, one song from this album from Friends that I wanted to bring up that uh, Al, I believe, co-wrote and also sings lead on, uh, Be Here in the Morning. Uh, I've always like really liked that song, but I find the vocal really interesting because like when I first heard it, I was like, I have no idea who's singing this because like it's such a weird kind of vocal. It's like in a yeah. weird higher register. It's almost like it's hard to describe it, but I was like, I got to look up who sings this because I wasn't 100 percent sure. So I looked it up and then I saw it was Al and I was like, huh, like that's really interesting because I can't really think of too many other like songs with Al on it where like he sounds like this, you know? So I think it's a really interesting vocal on that song. Yeah, really yeah, sure. I think this is, yeah. this is definitely the the time where Brian would have either not been able or simply not wanted to do those like high falsetto vocals you know it's not easy for a dude to to get those notes out of his mouth so he this was probably definitely the era where you had brian going like just passing all these vocals off to al but yeah i think uh quite a bit actually of the falsetto vocals on friends sounds like al to me Mm -hmm. um yeah and being here in the morning is is definitely a standout track for me probably my probably my favorite on the album oh wow uh, yeah, this is cool. like a a silly story but i'd sort of be remiss if i didn't tell it that that song be here in the morning actually created like a friendship for me so i was at, in a kind of a cool one at that so i was in LA uh, gosh this was maybe nine years ago and mm -hmm. I was at a guitar store and I was playing be here in the morning on guitar and from around the corner this guy walks into the store or walks into my part of the store that I was in carrying a guitar and he starts playing the song with me and singing along <laughs> and I was like no way like when how often do you meet someone that knows an album cut from the friends, you know? And That's... lo and behold, he's actually the current guitarist for the sixties rock band love, which was sort of like the first uh, integrated rock band is sort of what they get credit for. Mm -hmm. um, and he's their guitarist these days. So his name is Mike. And so we bonded over our love of be here in the morning and he actually showed me that I was playing one of the chords wrong. He's like, oh, no, it's actually this, not this. 
And so now every time I play that song or hear that song, I think about him. So that was definitely a, a trip of an experience for sure. That's, that's so cool. That is awesome. That. Their album, uh, what's the album that they have that's like really famous? I forgot the name of it. Oh, Forever Changes? Yeah, that's one of my, I love I love Forever Changes. That's one of my yeah. Favorites. That's sick. Yeah, and I, speaking of friends and love, um, on, I believe it was that album, or no, the one before it, Love had a, a hit cover of Burt Bacharach's My Little Red Book, and Brian was cool with the Love guys back in the day since they were both making music in Hollywood. And Brian and the boys recorded their version of My Little Red Book during the Friends session. And I can only assume that as much as Brian was a Bacharach fan, that the inspiration for the Beach Boys doing that could have come from the Love version. Yeah, it's interesting. I know Brian was like playing around with a lot of backer act tunes around this time, so it makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I guess coming out of Friends, going into 2020, uh, Al continues to sort of blossom as his own sort of voice within the group. And on 2020, what would stand out to me would be obviously Cotton Fields, which... Uh, this version is the Brian Wilson production of Cotton Fields, but still Al's lead vocal. And for me, the definitely the standout moment for Al on 2020 is uh, his falsetto vocals on Time to Get Alone. Yeah. Um, that chorus, I'm, you know, 99.99% sure that that's Al singing the part that's sort of the Brian Wilson-esque lead vocal on the chorus. Um, and he just knocks that out of the park. I agree. I love that song so much. It's one of my probably probably my favorite song in that album. It's between that and I can hear music, I think. But uh, yeah, I absolutely love that song. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Nate, um, relating to that album. So, uh, you know, you mentioned Al sings uh, Cotton Fields on that album, the uh, the Brian Wilson produced version. So uh, we have one of the guys on our podcast that's usually here, uh, Justin. He actually prefers the uh, the album version over the single version. Um, and I was curious to hear uh, your thoughts on that or if you agree with that, because uh, personally, I believe all of the rest of us 100 percent prefer the single version because we think uh, it added a lot of energy to the song. I think we all like like Red Roads on guitar. I think we like that more like country sound it has. And we feel like Al really like kind of energized the song where on 2020, it kind of feels like it's lacking a little. So, like, what is your general opinion on that? Yeah, I would I would definitely say. Cotton Field, Al's version of Cotton Fields was one of those songs that took me from like a casual Beach Boys fan to like hardcore sort of. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that might be, that might be one of my favorite Al productions. Cause it's got like this huge sort of Spectorian meets country vibe to it. Like you said, with Red Roads on the guitar and, uh, Dennis on the drums. So yeah, I think um oh man, it's a tough call for me because the 2020 Brian Wilson version, I'm not sure uh if you guys are Disney fans at all, but it definitely gives me Splash Mountain like Frontierland <laughs> vibes. Uh yeah. and like it definitely you can like picture like a bunch of guys sitting on their porch in like the old south you know, doing like the Brian version with mm -hmm. the banjos and stuff. But Al's version, it just like, he knocked it out of the park. It sounds like a very sequential, like logical follow-up to Sloop John B. And it was a really, it was a big hit internationally for the band. It, it didn't mm -hmm. do much here in the States, but it was, it was a big hit in Europe that they, Beach Boys still play it to this day when they're overseas. So I'm going to have to go with the Al version. Yeah, I feel like he added a lot of, like I mentioned, like a lot of energy to it. And I just feel like he made it a more like distinctive, memorable song. And I, I was going to mention that too, that like it was a huge hit overseas. So like another example, and Al has another one of those too that we'll get to uh, a little bit later, a song that was yeah. really big overseas. Um, but uh, yeah, I can totally see why it was a hit over there. I think it's really well produced and I think Al did a great job with it. Um, I listen to it quite often actually, so I, I love it. There's something I love about... Uh... 
Al's version of cotton fields is there's there's a phenomenon in audio production when you're recording too loud, something called clipping occurs, um, mm. which is where the audio breaks up and distorts and you're really like not supposed to ever let things clip if you're an engineer, but cotton fields has a lot of clipping and it was probably accidental because it was one of the beach boys only live recordings, like truly live sort of live in the studio, if that makes sense, where all the vocals and instruments were recorded at once. And so there were a lot of instruments and, and they were recording it in like a mobile studio. And so the clipping is probably unintentional, but I, it's, it just sounds extremely pleasing to my ears on like the couple of moments on that re record where the audio just get like overloads. It's almost always when Dennis is playing the fills. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that Dennis continuously like speeds up and gets to like a a breakneck, like heart attack level tempo on on that Al version of Cotton Fields. And he's mm -hmm. just smashing the hi hat so loud. Um so yeah, the energy is just killer on that version. There you go. I just learned something. I had no idea that like that song was pretty much like recorded live with like everyone playing at the same time. I did not know that at all. So that's awesome. Did not know that. Yeah, you can definitely feel that like live spirit like coming through mm -hmm. on that song more than most of their songs. A lot of their songs are very like so polished. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Steve Desper, their their long their engineer for the seventies. Uh, I've been lucky enough to uh, talk with him quite a bit. And Steve Desper told me that one time as an experiment, he took different four bar sections of Hal Blaine drumming mm -hmm. and put them on top of each other. And they would line up identically <laughs> if when he would combine different sections of Hal Blaine's playing. And I, I bring that up because so many of the Beach Boys songs are like perfectly performed at like a very consistent tempo, very consistent volume. You can tell that they were being like mindful of the studio acoustics, but Cotton Fields is like just balls to the wall, like rocking out. And so yeah. it's cool. It's like one of their most energetic records for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, then we're going to Sunflower which Power. is another album that really uh, sees Al as like one of the MVPs. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, it's another one where not many of them stand up particularly as like, oh, here's the Al song, <laughs> where something like Lady Linda might or uh, Santa Ana Wins, where, you, yeah. where it's very recognizable as the Al song. But... You have him co-writing on It's About Time with Carl and Dennis. And you also have him co-write Our Sweet Love with Carl and Brian and At My Window with Brian as well. And he was one of the album's main producers as well. Yeah, and that's uh, that song At My Window. That's another one of those songs where it borrows, I think, uh, a folk melody, right? From a song, I think it's like, is it Raspberries, Strawberries that's, or something? Yeah, that's, that's right. And I... I actually forgot, but that song actually began life as you're right, as an Al Jardine arrangement of mm -hmm. yeah, Raspberries and Strawberries by the Kingston Trio. And at some point evolved into uh where Brian and Carl took it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some people slag off that song. I really love that song. I think it's great. And I love the vocals of the members across that song. Like, yeah, like Bruce's vocal and then Al's got some vocals on there. I just I love it. Yeah, I, I, I love it so much, too. And I think um, something, and I don't have uh, necessarily, well, so I have heard Al and Bruce allude to this, and uh, Jesper also told me basically as much that the interesting thing about Sunflower and Surf's Up is those were the Beach Boys' uh, first albums with reprise records after their Capitol contract expired. 
Mm -hmm. And it was very important to reprise that Brian Wilson would be actively involved on those albums. And the only issue, as we know, is that Brian was going through some health issues. And so his contributions to those albums were sporadic. And so a lot of the Brian vocals on Sunflower and Surf's Up are either Al Al completely doing his best Brian impression or mm-hmm. maybe one track of Brian sort of quiet in the mix filled in with a, a couple Al's on top. And so <laughs> a lot of people observe with the Brian vocals on on Sunflower and Surf's Up, they observe them as being more shrill than Brian's vocals normally ha- had always been. And so my theory with that is it was less to do with Brian's vocals per se, and it was actually sort of a a side effect of, of replacing where Brian was supposed to be with Al doubling him or Al sort of filling in for him. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think it's sort of interesting to listen to those two albums with that sort of lens. Um, Cause yeah, Al's all over the place vocally and you might not hear Al's harmonies vocals on those albums as much if you're listening for where Al normally is in the stack. But if you're listening to the falsetto stuff, you sort of hear Al's sort of unique twang and you're like, Oh, Oh, there he is. He's right. up higher, where normally he's sort of down in the middle. Right. And so it's cool that Al was like better, I in my opinion, better than any better than Fosquet, R.I.P., better than Adrian Baker, better than Matt Jardine. I think no one else uh recreated Brian Wilson's vocals as well as Al. And I think mm-hmm. Al sort of got to hit the height of his powers of being able to do that during the early 70s. And I love a lot of um, like talking about those albums, Sunflower and Surf Sub. I love a lot of like Al's little like solo lead parts throughout those songs, like on Add Some Music with that line towards the end. Uh, and on every day of the summertime, you know, you'll hear children. I just children I love the taste and ice cream. Car. Yeah. yeah, that might be one of my favorite parts of that whole song, just because of the way that that Al sings it. He just sings it so good. And then I also think of Don't Go Near the Water with the. Uh, Toothpaste and soap can make the ocean the bubble bath. You know, like he just, he sings it. The way he sings it is so distinctive and unique. And it really shows you like what he brought to the group in terms of his vocals, you know? Um, I, I love that. I love that he gets to like have those moments on those albums where like you really hear him and it's great. I love it. And Don't Go Near the Water is cool too because uh, it's either one of the only or possibly, possibly the only Beach Boys song that has Al on lead guitar. Um, Mm. So all the lead stuff you hear on on Don't Go Near the Water is Al. Interesting. He's normally very shy to play any type of riffing or solo stuff. Um, But yeah, and that song has really kind of funky guitar sounds with, uh, what is that, Riley? Sounds like sort of like wah-wah or certain things like that (laughs) on that song. Yeah, so... So really cool guitar work from Al on that song. And I think Al also played, there's quite a few sort of piano parts happening on Don't Go Near the Water, but one of them is Al. So so a lot of people don't might not think of Al as a keyboard player, but Al did play the keys too. So, and then you've got uh, uh, Take the Load Off Your Feet. Yes. Which is like, uh, that's one of those songs that like, I feel like we all probably had a similar reaction where we were either like so weirded out or potentially grossed out. But then the song is just so damn catchy and creative with all the sound effects and all the wacky instruments <laughs> and stuff that you just fall in love with it. And Al, no, you and don't. that one is another example of Brian sings like the first line or something. And then yeah. the rest is almost all Al, but it's sort of like, that one's like a great example of that, like Brian Al covering for Brian, sort of like them sort of like comped on top of each other sort of thing that they were doing then. Yeah. 
if you couldn't tell Nate, uh, Riley despises this song. He he does not like the lyrics at all. Um, but uh, he doesn't like feet. Um, yeah, I, 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 I am, am also like extremely, uh, turned off. off. Yeah. But, uh, but I just love how like creative the production is and like the stories of Brian, like, revving the engine on the rolls or like smashing stuff outside of his house and breaking the yeah. glass and all that. Uh, that was like a, a very cool, it was almost like the beach boys returning to the smiley smile, like uh, experimental avant-garde sort of like, we're going to use a bunch of like household items and sound effects as part of the music. So that's what I can say about that song, but I wish they wrote it about any other subject. Oh yeah. <laughs> If there was like an instrument, there's got to be an instrumental out there that I'd much prefer. But, um, and then, uh, you got Al's looking at tomorrow, which I believe also began life as a folk song, The Wanderer. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. People always, uh, um, I think, uh, Beach Boys historian Andrew Rideau quipped that Al is a better rewriter than writer <laughs> and but that's a skill in itself and i think it's cool that because that's um a, a genuine tradition in the world of folk and jazz mm -hmm. is like Blues rewriting too. yeah so so as cool as it is for someone like brian and mike to be able to come up with like completely original stuff it's also cool that you have someone like al who's like a gifted reinterpreter um, and I feel and looking at tomorrow is like a really neat record. Like Al's vocals are quite unique and the the sound the um the sound effects as far as like the the production goes and it's a cool song. Yeah, I feel like that song fits in so well on that album too. You know, like the whole Surf's Up album has kind of that darker vibe to it, you know. And I just feel like it fits in so well. Like the production is so like haunting on that song and I love, like you said, like the effects. Like I love, like that middle section with like the ba 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 ba. Yeah. You know, boop, boop, boop. You know, like I just, it's such a cool sounding song, and um, it's one of those songs where, like, yeah, like you said like it's an old song that Al kind of just like rewrote the lyrics and reworked it, but it's like that arrangement and the production of it works so well on that album, and it's always been kind of like a guilty, not I wouldn't say a guilty pleasure, but one of those songs I feel like people kind of like either overlook or just kind of view as forget forgettable but i really love it i think it's great there's also that um you sent you sent that i think it was on the reddit and then i think you sent it to me was that like yeah oddly i think it was like from 1982 or 83 like, yeah randomly yeah. Just, like, going like all prog on it i really enjoyed that yeah. i wish that was at, up with it. i saw brian wilson and al in 28 19 18 or 19 and they performed that like bluesy proggy version of looking at oh tomorrow. wow and uh of course brian was like <laughs> uh uh an observer but al was kicking ass yeah and uh yeah and some al actually i guess i don't know where i would work this in so i'll just say it now while it's on my mind but i think something really cool is sort of like i said al was always really shy about playing lead guitar but um i'd say around I, I follow like all the current live stuff like really closely. I've seen Brian and Mike and Dean Torrance and all of them quite a few times. And over the last few years, for whatever reason, I think Al became much more confident in his guitar playing again. And mm -hmm. so he started playing some leads again, or not again, really for the first time. So when I saw that show, Al played lead on sail on sailor sort of trading off leads with blondie and he played lead on that looking at tomorrow and then of course with his storyteller shows and a lot of his family and friends shows he's been the only guitarist and so he's been playing all the solos and so it's cool to see al like finally like embracing his instrumental skills and just like yeah. showing off his chops a little bit yeah he's one of the guys i've wanted to see live for a while since i've like been a fan and i'm just he only really plays on the west coast so i know i know i feel you as a he doesn't as far come east, west as, that often either i'm about as far east as you can get 
Right. <laughs> right. He might come around eventually though, because I know like I, I saw him last summer um, at like an outdoor festival uh, in, I forgot where it was, but it was like 15 minutes from my house. And uh, it was a good show. It was him and Matt Jardine and a couple other, the, some of the long time, like Beach Boys backing members. I think like Ed Carter was there, a couple of those guys. So oh, was, was that when he, I think he played in like the northernmost part of Wisconsin. So it would have been like really far from me, but it may have been somehow closer to you with uh, I guess I don't mean to dox our, uh, <laughs> no, it's all right. No, it was very close to me. Like it was literally like a 15 minute drive, but, um, yeah, yeah I, it was, a, it was a good show. I did. Al, Al did sound a little, I think Al was a little sick that day. I mentioned this before on another episode, but like he didn't sound up to like his usual standard that day, but, uh, I really enjoyed it. It was great seeing him again. Cause the last time I had seen him was with Brian and that was a while ago. So, so was um, that, was he the only guitarist there or was Probin or Rob there? Doing um he had i do think he had someone else there with him i couldn't tell you who but i do think he did um yeah so um but yeah so let's see i guess going oh going forward quick. again oh yeah no real, yeah go, go ahead yeah real quick just one other thing i wanted to mention uh about like another little part of a song that i love from al uh i believe this is Al. you can correct me if i'm wrong nate but on a day in the life of a tree that line at the end like that there's nothing oh, for me yeah of that like he sounds it's so good and i think that's alan that, oh no no lay yeah. down my branches to the yeah so good i love thank that thank you so for reminding me of that because that's a yeah. song i really don't get to i don't listen to that one too often you know like yeah you know not one when i'm like trying to get in my happy little beach boy mood or whatever that might yeah. come to mind but yeah al's vocals on there are like spectacular and it's like such a hidden easter egg i think they're even panned to like one side Mm -hmm. and you have to like listen so carefully to even like hear it because it's like during the fade out but yeah i love that part that's like the highlight of the song for me yeah like the whole ending of that song because i feel like with that song the issue people have with it that have a hard time getting into it is getting past like jack riley's vocal on it you know and that was kind of my issue initially too but over time it just really grew on me like it's play it really fits well in the album and i have grown to kind of like jack's vocal on it and yeah that whole ending is just like so haunting like as the song kind of like fades out i just i love it um yeah al sounds so good on that so going into carl and the passions i mm -hmm. and let's you know, it's it's almost sometimes easier to look at uh, Carl and the Passions and Holland sort of as like one album or like one era, so to speak. And really, to me, this is where Al reaches his like pinnacle of his contributions to the band. And even though they're sort of like few and far between on those records, what he does contribute is like some of the most the greatest stuff I've ever heard. So yeah, like, like you said at the beginning, you've got all this is that, which is like heavenly. And that was uh, very much um, Al's composition and like Al's chords and melody. And, and um, I think Mike's contributions were more in the lyrical department. And I think Carl's contributions were more in the production department. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, certainly al's like shining moment as a composer and it's another one that sort of as we can now hear the demo of thanks to the ceylon box set is it began life as a interpretation of the robert frost poem but it became sort of so far removed from what it was originally that it's like definitely its own own piece right um sort of how you rather referencing a a song you wrote that was inspired by something, but by the time it gets to being finished, you know, it's a completely new song. So I don't really think like, I think, I think of something as like looking at tomorrow as like something that's clearly derivative, but to me, all this is that is, is definitely like a very original one of a kind type of record. Yeah, like when you listen to, you mentioned like how like it originally began life is like kind of Al doing like that Robert Frost poem, like The Road Not Taken, I believe it's called. But um, there's like, if you listen to that Sail on Sailor recording of like him doing that, that, or that early version, I was like, when I first listened to it, I was kind of waiting to like hear like the similarities, like, okay, this is supposed yeah. to be that. And then right at the end you get, and that makes all the difference to me. And I was like, there it is, you know, like now yeah. okay, there's the part. I had the same experience where it's like, 
I'm not sure I'm really hearing like where this lines up, but then you're like, you get to the end and you're like, ah, and you can almost picture like how the demo finishes like that, that they were all like, wait, light bulb moment. And you can sort of <laughs> picture them all like, you know, where, and what I love about that demo, if I'm not mistaken, is you literally hear Carl like walk into the studio and Al and Carl start chatting and Al's like, oh yeah, I'm working on this, uh, <laughs> whatever it's like you just get to hear yeah. this like little moment of like just them being friends and it's pretty cool yeah and i just wanted to mention too so this song i would say it is my favorite like al co-writing credit because i just absolutely love this song it made my uh, top 10 beach boy song list when we did that um the part of this song i especially love where al comes in on, after like the second verse the um golden auras glow around you i'm the present love surrounds yeah. you yeah as the sun you and i are truly one like the out the way al sings that is just like so heavenly and i just absolutely love the song it's so like dreamy sounding and beautiful it, it's very much like all i want to do i kind of view it as like a cousin to that song and like the production and the style and uh yeah, of course, great point and carl at the end with the j guru dev i mean that's just like one of my favorite beach boys moments period i just love that and I, I just love the song. I couldn't say enough about it. And I think I mentioned, like, if this was, like, one of the only things Al did with the band, I would already, like, have so much respect and, like, admiration for him. Is that I love this song. Um, yeah. I mean, so, and then, I guess, also, we've got to got to throw a shout out to the, uh, the whole California saga, yeah. which, um, you know, it, it begins with, with Mike's Big Sur, but Al still produced produced that. And it's cool because um, the version of the song that that Mike had produced during the Sunflower Sessions was that 4-4 version, um, which is pretty cool because it actually uses one of the earliest drum machines. And so um, the drums on that on the original version are actually electronic. Um, but then you have Al's version of Big Sur, or his arrangement, I should say which is in that like waltz time, which just like gives the song a whole different feel and flavor. So, which goes into the Beaks of Eagles, which um, is definitely a weird one. <laughs> I I could assume <laughs> you guys are sort of feel the same way. Riley that loves that it. song. Yeah, that one throws me for a loop every time I, I like listen to the, the poem lyrics and try to make sense of it. Um, but I love the the musical sections. Me too. It's like a great pop song juxtaposed with that weird like stoned poem part. Like it's a cool yeah. light. It's cool. Yeah, like the the dawn's new light, a man might venture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you like about that one, Riley? I don't know. It's just I, I hated it for a while, and then I learned it was Al, and I'm like, yeah, this is something Al would do. And uh, <laughs> totally. So I listened to a, to that um that whole like suite of songs that like uh, the saga as a whole a lot um especially like when I was like freshman year of college and it just like I don't know what it was I just I just really it just really jived with me and I I just I do listen to like a an edited version without it sometimes too that I still really yeah enjoy. I like that one too but I I I don't know I don't really know what it is about it that I really like I I think it's a well written poem I mean I I've kind of had like my like time with poetry i used to like like reading it and i, I think it just kind of clicked with me because of that but i don't know what it is it, it just works with me i don't dislike it i understand why people won't like it because it's very like hipster and like pretentious <laughs> i can understand that and i thought the yeah. same way when i thought it was mike doing it but <laughs> it was um <laughs> but i don't know it just it just clicks with me it really works great as a segue i don't i don't think i've ever listened to uh, beaks of eagles on its own but yeah. um, as a segue, as part of the saga, I think it works really well. And then once you get to the totally. last part of California, it just, it's kind of like, it kind of makes sense of what just happened before. It just like, it works great as the, that lead up to, I'm on my way to sunny California, that kind of thing. It just, it works really well as a, as like a segue. I really enjoy it. I've never really thought about it this way until this like literally just popped into my head. But uh, it's almost sort of like Mike and Al made a mini smile that just sort of like lives inside of Holland because it has <laughs> like that very similar like sort of like looking at America and California with like the rose colored glasses you know and like 
sort of like that like whimsical like look at like the uh colonial like settler era of america and the pioneers and all that so it's sort of like you can definitely like sort of see that smile influence on that whole little california saga yeah not to mention cool cool water being a direct uh influence on california saga the song yeah where they sort of reprise that song yeah i've I've kind of always thought of like holland as like it, it is that kind of like spiritually very similar to smile where it's like the americana vibe to the album and then all yeah, of the, that's the, the whole word album I was sort of looking for americana yeah and the, and the whole album is kind of like referencing those like american history not even just in the saga but like in steamboat and in the trailer, trailer it has a lot yeah. of that reference yeah i've always really enjoyed it like i'm I'm a history ed major, so I guess that stuff just kind of like clicks with me about like American history. But I've yeah, always I love really American liked history. that. What I said, I love American history. Yeah, so like, there's the, probably the... a big crossover of Beach Boy fans and like American history buffs. Yeah, just given you know America's band and all that. Sort and then of you thing. have um Van Dyke contributing lyrics to Sail on Sailor. Like, You're right. Whole You're album, right. I don't. I've kind of that was always been in the back of my mind, like, oh, this kind of like smile, but like it's more of like a group group effort rather than just Brian and Van Dyke, but sort of like a prog smile. Yeah, that's why I like it. I'm a big prog guy, if you couldn't tell. Like I got my like my Pink Floyd shit. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Van Dyke. Um yeah, and it's interesting, like sort of seems like Ceylon may have been just as much a Van Dyke song as like a Brian song. Like yeah it's I don't, I most don't think... of brian's collaborators were just lyricists but van dyke was unique because he was like another composer as well yeah and i think i've read that van dyke sort of takes credit for that one like heavily yeah and you can almost sort of hear on the on the writing session demo that sort of leaked that that um hypnotize sort of like van dyke things. yeah it's sort of like van dyke is is uh trying to help his buddy by having him put the icing on the cake of his song that seems pretty much ready to go, you know? Yeah. I I know that Tannen Almer has that writing credit. I'm pretty sure that's because he, like, gave Brian drugs or something. At least in that instance. I know. There's all sorts of stories. And then the Ray Kennedy guy who's on that, on the credits, too, claims that, that he wrote it because he has a version of it, too. Um, mm. and So, you know, who knows? They all, They were all, you know... I, I think it was mostly like a, and it was it was mostly Jack Brian and Van Dyke and too. Jack Ryan, yeah. but but no. yeah and um yeah and that one's interesting too, uh, because I think it's oh you know I know this is the Al episode but um Al I actually don't think is on that one, I think it's um Blondie Ricky Carl doing the and mike and they have one and they also have some special guests doing the vocals too they had billy hinchy and uh jerry beckley of oh. america singing oh, yeah. sail on sailor yeah. um which is just a uh, sort of fun fact but so let's see what's coming up um okay so now we're going to 15 big ones love oh. you Real, real quick, I did want to mention one other song. Yeah, please, please. I'll make a feature on, on here. I feel like we should shout out uh, Funky Pretty. I love Al's vocals. Oh, good. yeah. I, I love that song in general because you get to hear vocals from, like, almost all the members, which is great. You know, like, you go around, you hear Carl. Yeah. Singing, and uh, I just love it. And I love Al's line, like, the, uh, uh, and if you're cosmically conscious, you'll be or you'll see. I, I just, I love that, too. So that's yeah, another he one. He really my... makes the most of the, of the one line he gets, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we can move on to uh, 15 big ones if you want. Um, So let's see. Yeah, I guess 15 big ones um, and Love You sort of sees like another one of those eras where Al sort of um, takes like a, a step back a little bit. But in fairness, all of the guys were because they were intentionally letting Brian sort of pick up the reins again. Yeah. Um however, I guess I would point out that uh Al's vocal performances are probably the strongest out of all the members on on 15 Big Ones in Love You. 
Um, you know, the other guys, Brian and Dennis and Carl's voices were all becoming affected by, you know, the substance use and Mike's voice was becoming awfully like nasal. <laughs> um, but Al still had that classic Al, you know, voice and that like that very identifiably Beach Boy voice. Yeah. And so Al's vocals are like the most consistent during that era for sure. And like Al, um, like I his his biggest contribution to those albums would definitely have to be just like, um, adding consistency to those harmonies. Yeah, I feel like for that era, for the 15 big ones and Love You era, there's three songs for me that really stand out in terms of like Al's vocals. So the first, of course, would be the song he wrote on 15 big ones, Susie Cincinnati, which uh, that song honestly was a bit of a grower for me. I remember I used to not really care for it, but uh, over time, it's really grown on me. I think it's a really fun song. Um, I love that. I think, Riley, you mentioned you love the little guitar intro like that. Me too. Down, That's down. my favorite riff and to play. Susie Cincinnati has always been one of my favorite songs by Al, period. It's, it's my yeah. easy standout on 15 big ones. I mean, maybe that's like a unpopular opinion, but that's my easy standout from it. Um, yeah, I, I think like it's it. in my top 10. Yeah, I'd probably put it in my top 10 most times of Beach Boy songs. Oh. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, wow. I've I have this like um like obsession with like the beach boys sort of like mid-tempo rockers where when when they're doing that thing that riley demonstrated of like the classic blues boogie woogie uh guitar playing style the jink to jink to jink to jink anytime they're doing that over like those like 70s rockers rock and roll music it's okay Susie cincinnati marcella you need a mess of help all those are like there's something about about those ones that I just cannot get enough of. Yeah. That, that great Al Jardine rhythm guitar. What what can I say? Um, um the the other two songs I wanted to mention. So these are both from Love You. Uh I wanted to mention his bridge the bridge section on Roller Skating Child. The uh Round and around. Yeah. I, I, I love that so much. Like I I that's like the highlight of the song for me. And I again, Riley, like I know you're kind of that song kind of weirds you out a little because of the lyrics and stuff. I totally get that, but for me, like that moment alone, like just makes that song. And I really enjoy it for that reason. I think Al just kills that vocal. Um, and then also, of course, we got to mention uh, Honking Down the Highway or Honking Down the Gosh Darn Down Highway. highway. Uh, one of the highlights on the album for me, and I feel like it's really because of Al's vocal. I mean, he just, he kills it. And I love the fun lyrics, like the uh, take in one little inch at a time now. I guess I've got away with girls. It's just like really funny, kind of fun lyrics. And uh, I just, I love Al's vocals so much on it. It's one of my favorite Al vocals, honestly, probably my top five. So, yeah. I like his version. Didn't he do a version for it for his uh, postcard to yeah. California? Post yeah. yeah. I think I almost prefer the version on postcard to California. Ooh, I, can, oh, I, can, I can't agree with that, but it's all right. I've heard it. It's not bad. Yeah. I, those were, those are definitely, definitely the standout moments for Al on those albums. Oh, and um, I think he sings the TM song. One, two, three. Oh yeah. Three, love four, four. Yeah. Love is a woman. Yeah. yeah on that little bridge part and TM song. Yeah. TM <laughs> song is um sort of on a similar line to their song problem child, which I know you shared the same opinion <laughs> on is uh, a weird intro sort of, sort of like leaving a bad taste on your mouth for an otherwise pleasant song. Like a TM song is like, has some interesting chord chord, progression going on and like a bizarre arrangement with like the choice of instruments but mm -hmm. the whole like fighting thing in the beginning just sort of like uh and i understand that like that's the whole joke and the whole thing they were trying to do is that oh i need to meditate but i'd like <laughs> much prefer the song if it just like was the song without like the mock argument at the beginning right yeah yeah, but you're right, though. Yeah, there's, like, interesting parts of it. It's never been, like, a favorite of mine, for sure. Like, I definitely rank it. on Of the tracks on that album, it's definitely lower for me. But, like, I do like, like, the Mahari, she gave it to me. And, uh, you know, it's got yeah. some nice... Yeah. And I like, though, how they play with the tempo. And it's, like, some people die real fast. And other, da, 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 da. Yeah. I'm forgetting yeah. the words, but, like, that little part. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, with the Beach Boys, it's sort of, like, if you ever watched the 
the other podcast that I did or or hear me talk about the Beach Boys, like I really like can't say I dislike any Beach Boys like song or album because like all of them, whether it's TM song or or just any of them, they all have at least something or another or some little moment that I it's either brilliant or so bad it's good <laughs> or somehow both at the same time. And so, yeah, TM song is one of those for me. Um, and then all right. oh, go ahead. we get to we f- get to finally move into the the album where Al definitely had like the only album where Al's like quite literally like the band leader for the record, and that's MIU. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is definitely I I made an interesting observation some time ago that I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on mm-hmm. that um that MIU is like, to me, sounds and seems very much like the spiritual predecessor to Postcard from California. And that I think they like really share quite a bit of like arrangement similarities. Like they both are like very acoustic guitar heavy, very like smooth sort of like adult contemporary sort of, I jokingly call MIU and postcards and unleash the love like <laughs> like uh surf adult contemporary where it's like a mix of like that classic beach boys sound with like a yacht rock sort of thing i guess you'd say yeah. Yeah, um yeah. so i think of 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 postcards as kind of like MIU part 2 um uh cuz it's like you know like even like the songwriting styles like pretty similar like kind of like gentle rockers, kind of like folky a little bit. Um, So I think MIU is is cool. I think uh, personally, like I can't say many of the songs are like very strong um, compared to like the heights of what the Beach Boys were capable of. Mm -hmm. But I do find the album uh, to be like a a fun listen and like a, a pleasant experience like Mm -hmm. i think i think like even though it's not the most exciting or groundbreaking record like i'm glad that al had at least one album where he got to be in charge and he got to be the producer and he got to oversee things um so i'm glad it exists for that reason for sure yeah i mentioned before on this podcast that album it's interesting to me because it's like I don't feel like I necessarily like, I don't mind the production. I kind of think it works okay with some of the songs. Uh, I don't really mind that smooth kind of yacht rock production that it has. Uh, For me, it's just kind of like, I'm kind of split on it. It's like half of the songs don't really do anything for me. But then also like, especially towards the second half of the album, I really like a lot of those songs. And quite a few of the songs, honestly, are songs that involve Al in some way that I like. Um, Like for example, uh, Come Go With Me, I think is a great cover. Uh, that's because a stone cold classic his his <laughs> version of that is just like yeah. one of the all-time great beach boy for sure yeah i just i love his vocal on it i think he really sells the song even though again like it's a cover i really love it um i also love the mike and al co-write pitter patter um i think Hell it's yeah. so like addictively catchy and that's i feel like one of those songs that i used to slag off but then like one day i re-listened to it and i was like this is really really catchy and like fun and i have no problem with it like i actually really enjoy it a lot um so to me those are al's highlights on that album uh not an al song but i also really love match point of our love i think it's a great song i feel like the production on that album really fits that song well like i love the little outro it's very like melancholic i like that a lot and then also of course my diane is great too so what i think is cool to note about miu too is that so for while so for the rest of their career after miu I would normally play guitar just on the songs that he wrote. And mm-hmm. other than that, he wouldn't play any instruments on their albums after MIU, really. Um, save for his songs. But MIU is is kind of the last album where Al is playing either guitar or bass or even keyboards or percussion on almost every song, if not all of them. And so uh, it's kind of... I've I've really for a long time wondered why Al 
kind of almost completely retired from being like a serious instrumentalist. Um, Cause like I said, like he really stopped playing on their albums and really only became like a singer on their albums and mm-hmm. on stage. Um, for a long time, I'd say it's like debatable if how much he was even like in the mix, let's say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd say like the one, silver lining of that is that like i said like in the last few years it seems like he actually regained his confidence as a guitarist and has been playing more again now um but yeah miu is i do think is also like quite notable for that reason and um even am i um sorry come go with me one thing i think is particularly cool about that is that one is almost completely al um (laughs) like all the guitars piano bass drums um wow like al basically played all their instruments um have you guys heard the story of how that come and go with me cover came to be um i'm not sure uh if you say it i'll, I'll tell you if i remember yeah so um so they concocted an idea that uh to motivate so this was after they they took down brian's home studio that they had used during the early 70s and mm-hmm. this was when they built Brother Studio in Santa Monica. And they thought that Brian was going to want to go down to the new fancy studio they built. But he didn't really want to go down there. Um, so they concocted this idea. This was happening during the 15 Big One sessions, actually. That Brian w- might want to record if they bring like a whole mobile recording unit inside of a truck filled with instruments to Brian's house that they they thought he would be enticed to come outside and record um but no one showed up except for al so al's sitting alone in this like mobile unit and so instead of just like wasting the engineer's time al started working on this come and go with me cover laying down one instrument at a time and they didn't put it on 15 big ones but during miu they resurrected it and um dennis actually added like another layer of drums and brian of course like came up with the horn arrangement and so there's like it's filled with horns and stuff but the majority of the instruments on that are all al so that's like a pretty cool fact too and i think probably the only time that there's quite a few songs where it's like all the instruments were brian or all the instruments were carl but i think Mm -hmm. that's the only time where al handled the majority of the instruments no that's super cool i didn't know that at all that yeah al pretty much like was totally responsible for that song with like everything with the production and the instruments and everything that's really cool and i didn't know even the song. intro the dum 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 i think that's all al's too with maybe wow. mike doing the bottom part yeah uh no i did know the only part i did know was that that song was recorded around the time of 15 big ones like i know there was an earlier version because i think i've heard it before like on youtube some channel uploaded it, i think but i have i did yeah. not know that so that's very cool yeah, and I think that 15 Big Ones version that floats around is the Just Al version, pretty much. I think the uh, other guys have their vocals on there, but the instruments, like with how sort of sparse it is, I mm-hmm. think that's the version where you can hear pretty much Just Al. So, um, One other interesting thing real quick about this song, too, is that initially, it wasn't this song initially released as a single, but it didn't do anything, and then they re-released it a few years yeah. later. Go well. Yeah, yeah, it's... um. Actually, if I recall correctly, I don't think it was a single oh. around the time of MIU. But yeah. no, you, it, but it, but they finally decided to release it as a single to promote Ten Years of Harmony. Uh, three three years later, yeah, and then it was a huge hit. And now I think, like most people that I meet, like most casual Beach Boys fans or, or you know, the casual fans who see them in concert. I think most people just think of it as a Beach Boys song, sort of like Barbara Ann and <laughs> yeah. Steve John B. Like, yeah. the Beach Boys did some covers so successfully that that they sort of became remembered as their own songs. They made it their own. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anything else about MIU? I mean, that album really, you know, it's like Al's album, Al's child, like baby, basically. So yeah. Besides oh, all that, winds uh, of sh- change. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Which, well, you know, he didn't yeah. write it, but but a, a like a heartfelt performance and a, a nice production, I'd say. 
yeah, the other guys on here, uh, Riley included, aren't particularly fond of that song. I actually don't mind it. I think it's nice and pleasant. Um, I can see why people, I think Matt, one of the guys on this podcast, has called it like it puts him to sleep, I think he said. But um, I do think Al delivers a really like genuine vocal. And I've said before that I always like the, at the very end, like the reference to like when I grow up, like the won't last. I was for- just going to say that too. I- yeah. No. And I think I've mentioned before, like, I feel like you can kind of interpret that as like almost the band viewing, like, you know, they were ending their contract. There was the end of their contract with uh, reprise and like they were moving on to a new label, kind of like a, you know, like, I feel like it's a good fitting yeah. track winds of change because things were changing within the band, you know? So, yeah, all there. I mean, and even to think that Dennis would be dead uh, only a yeah. few years later and mm-hmm. all the stuff Brian had been going through, like, to me, a lot of the like, heavy shit that was going on in their lives sort of comes through on on that winds of change and my my diane are sort of like you almost get these two like very pet sounds-esque songs like hidden inside of miu which is mostly like a smooth smooth rock sort of like thing but then you get these two like very pretty like uh intricately orchestrated ballads it is interesting that album MIU, how like you can kind of compare it to obviously again, I'm not saying this album is as good as an album like Pet Sounds are today, because it's not. But like you look at like the album structure, I feel like the first half you have the more like poppier songs, and then it closes with like three kind of melancholic songs, you know, like you yeah. have my winds of change. Obviously, match point does have some energy to it, but it's also very melancholic. Like it's a very to me, even though the lyrics are cheesy, I actually am very moved by it. So I like it a lot. Yeah, I know what you mean. I agree about that. And I that's actually like a yeah or sort of like how today follows that same like poppy followed by introspective yeah yeah to me that sort of adds like a whole new cool dimension to miu that i never noticed before but i need that that's cool yeah all right should we move on to uh la unless riley you have anything else you want i nah not really yeah so la is um uh Really, I was even thinking about this earlier today, just because I'm always thinking about the Beach Boys. But uh, <laughs> L.A. is really like like um, five, four or five guys making solo music um, that's all put on one album. And it was like kind of quite literally made that way where where Carl, Al and Mike and Dennis were basically all doing their own stuff with Bruce floating between them to like tie together some sort of cohesion with this. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in that way, it's a lot like the white album by the Beatles where you can very sort of clearly tell that it's sort of like several guys, solo music sort of like compiled together, Mm -hmm. which is really cool because all the different personalities get to shine through. But you know, for that reason um, you don't get to really hear much of Al Um, I don't even really think he's on Carl or Dennis's songs, but his one shining moment, Lady (laughs) Linda, definitely uh, helped pay the bills for the band during that that time, let's say, because, again, while it didn't do much in the States, it was like a home run hit around Europe. Number six. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. No, I, I I really love that song. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs on L.A. Uh, besides like, you know, Good Time and I really love as well. But um, that song, I think it's great. I love Al's vocal on it. Um, of course, I feel like kind of like in Al's tradition, he's kind of borrowing from someone else because you've got like the I know it's like the Bach kind of influence. He's got like mm-hmm. the Bach to it uh i know uh what's his name uh, ron Alpeck also helped uh al uh with this song mm-hmm. like structured the composition of it but i really love this song it's very heartfelt obviously like it was to his um his wife at the time uh linda and uh i just i, I really love this song a lot i think it's great and uh it's a kind yeah. of like a guilty pleasure for me i know some people aren't a fan of this one but i, I love it i love it it's another one that i i frequently like would if you ask me my top 10 Lady Linda would definitely probably be in there a lot. Um, I'm like, I'm a big sucker for, for chord progressions and for like interesting chord progressions and, and Lady Linda's like chords are quite unique. And so like, that's something that always stood out to me. And yeah, like sort of like you said, like um, I just think that Al's 
love for his then wife just like really shines through on the song and it feels like very heartfelt and then the acapella section is just like da, I, da, heaven, ooh, heaven. Anyone, yeah that's that's one of my favorite and parts. i love during the nebworth show when they like reprise it again and mike's like one more time and they all sing <laughs> it again like to me that's like one of the probably one of the last moments of hearing that like iconic beach boys harmony and it's like full glory yeah no i'm not i've, I've mentioned before like i'm not a musician or anything so I, I can't really go into like chords or anything but i love um i love like the transition from the first verse to the second you know where it goes into like that linda won't you say that i am Yo, yeah I love and that's particularly love the that. part because it does sort of kind of change keys to, yeah arguably in that part and this is like your ears definitely pick up you're like oh whoa like that's right it's like he catches your ear yeah and um anything else about la with al i i love uh, i love lady linda um I, that's like one of those songs like i have a friend who's like really into like the early beach boys stuff he really likes the um like the he really he's one of his favorite songs of all time is don't worry baby so you can kind of like tell like where he's at with the band but i remember mm -hmm. i was like in a car ride to uh i think the dollar store and we we're just getting like a bunch of snacks and um randomly i just hear dun, 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 dun. and i'm like you're not playing lady linda are you he's like yeah of course i am so like it's weird because he really likes like don't worry baby in my room all of that because he's like a big like singer guy and um out of nowhere he just has lady linda coming on so i was like oh shit so i i really like i really like lady linda i'm not a big fan of lady lady liberty though that that, oh, that screw, lady like, liberty is an atrocity <laughs> like the I, vocals I, the rhythm oh of the vocals don't even fit into the song and it makes no sense it, it's oh my god but um i really yeah. like linda um it's not my favorite on la i'm a big fan of the carl and dennis tracks um i really like angel come home and love yeah. surrounds me and full sail and going south all of those but i mean this is this is probably one of the first songs on the album that really did click with me this in good time and so i, yeah. I love lady linda lady, lady liberty is shit <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> Yeah, just like they were like, yeah, rewrite the lyrics, make them like patriotic. But like, again, it just sounds like there was no effort put into it. And like you said, the vocals don't even match up with the the melody. I feel like like Nate, I know you're a big defender of a lot of these songs, but I mean, will you I mean, do you defend that? I mean, I think that's awful. The Lady Liberty. but Yeah, I mean, I definitely <laughs> like had the same like, like jaw dropped. Like, what am I listening to reaction the first time I heard it, especially that they replaced uh bobby figueroa's like extremely tasteful drumming with like a loud ass drum machine um <laughs> but uh i sort of i i i sort of understand a little bit of the context of he uh divorce linda he they still have this big hit of a song and so he's probably like oh i'm gonna have to sing this like the rest of my life and i was divorced now like can we please rewrite it they were doing the the farm aid and this is when they became became like america's band like tm you know um and like to me it should work like i don't see why it, it doesn't but it it doesn't like yeah. and to me it's sort of like again like i can still see a lot of good with it like it still has the same like underlying like pretty um like melody and yeah. chords and stuff but like you say like it the 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 rhythm gets a little screwed up by like the clunky adaptation of the words and yeah it's it's like one of those like uh blemishes for sure but but i'd still say there's enough to me that makes it redeeming that i mm -hmm. would probably still listen to it over a lot of other band songs yeah that's fair on to keeping the summer alive yeah and i guess like really from this point forward i think uh since we're talking about al specifically we can sort of at least in the way that i look at it sort of like lump summer alive beach boys 85 still yeah. cruising summer in paradise um man uh, i love beach boys 85 so much yeah. <laughs> together yeah oh yeah i just mean not well, only because, well, yeah. yeah yeah not only because they sh not only because they share like a lot of sonic similarities but also because they all essentially only have like one or two al songs 
Um, track of your love. So yeah, Summer <laughs> Alive. Um, uh, I I think Al's both of Al's moments on keeping the summer alive are are like are cool like great moments of the album for me. I think I think Santa Ana wins as a composition is like an incredible song. Um, but I do think the production, yep. the arrangement of the released version, um, is a little lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I think the song is actually so good that, that it's still great despite like a questionable production sound. And then, yeah. um, school days is, is cool too, because then you sort of have like a trilogy of the Beach Boys doing Chuck Berry because you've got you start with Surfing USA um, and then you get rock and roll music and then finally School Days. So I sort of see those as like a nice little trilogy of the Beach Boys interpreting Chuck Berry. And Al's vocal on there is great, too. Yeah, I I like Santa Ana Winds, but I, I much prefer the um like the early version the, of it. The L.A., yeah. But yeah. I, I do. I do, I do really like the um, the Santa Ana winds are like a scientific like that little <laughs> intro that Al does. I know it's, it's such like, a, like a weatherman. That's what I mean. Like the the spoken word is like such an Al thing to do, and it just like it. it I feel like he never heard a spoken word intro like he didn't love. Like every part of <laughs> wants to like hate like the spoken word by Al, but I I just I just love it, and then he's like, and then it goes right into the song. I I really but I I prefer the um the stripped back version with the less glossy finish over it way more than the keeping the summer alive version. Like I know you say like the chord progression really works for you either way, but I gotta be honest, like I can't really listen to the keeping the summer alive version. I can really only listen to that, like the like um I don't really want to call it a demo, but that the uh the early outtake version. Yeah, you one know, thing I that I learned recently that I think is really uh fascinating just from like a music production standpoint, um. And I think we all disagree with the decision, but the way that it was actually went about is pretty fascinating. So, so as we know, Bruce produced L.A. and uh, Keeping the Summer Alive. And surprisingly, I think it was actually Bruce's call to hold off on that original version of Santa Ana Winds that that we all referenced that we like better. Um because he just didn't really feel like it was all coming together as like a record. It was too demo-ish for him. And so uh, they actually kept... So at some point between um, the ori that original version that we all love, that has been bootlegged a million times, Al did a new, a new vocal on top of that version. Um, because as as we hear the lyrics change between those two versions but bruce still wasn't really satisfied with it and so they actually deleted everything except for al's vocal and mm -hmm. re-recorded the new version against al's vocal like so they recorded the new instrument the new instrumental with al's original vocal in the headphones and built it the whole new arrangement around the vocal which is like a really rare way to record a song. Like 99% yeah. of the time you record the instruments first and then the vocals. So it's kind of cool that they recorded a instrumental around a vocal. I imagine that would be more challenging to do, right? To have right, to put right. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably like a painstaking process, I have to imagine. Yeah, that that song, I do feel like that song is one of the ones that frustrates me the most on keeping the summer alive because like I think the song is great. I, but like like you guys have said, I feel like the production just really holds it back. Like I, I've mentioned this before on a previous episode with the with, when the when the other guys were on, but um like the part like when like the backing vocals come in, like the Santa Anna wins, it just it's sounds really very, like very harsh blare. and abrasive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't sound the way it should. And the vocals just feel very like, I don't know, like artificial. They just don't feel natural to me. Um and, and there's part that exciter thing that I was referencing, yeah. Was that oh, okay. new uh, technology they were using. And also, like I will say, to give the production credit, I do like like that instrumental part towards the end. You know, like where it's just like, I don't yeah, know. How to yeah, yeah, that's really pretty. Yeah, I, I, I wish there was more of that. But instead, yeah, you got a lot of just very like blaring vocals. And I will say, Mike sounds very nasally on his parts on this song, and I think it hurts it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, 
yeah. to me, that's probably the only moment for me personally of Mike's nasally sound where it, it truly becomes like distracting <laughs> for me from from the song. Like for I was, me, I, I was... love Mike Love's voice, and so like I dig the bunnies in and all that. Fun, yeah. fun, fun, all that stuff but yeah Santa Ana wins is probably the only song where I'm like really Bruce why did you not ask for another take <laughs> like right but or just it's interesting I actually um my fiance is a like a trained singer and she like went mm-hmm. to school for singing and she said that um as vocalists get older they're actually taught to start singing in that nasal kind of way because it somehow like preserves their voice and is a healthier way to sing so like she and i actually kind of have a theory that mike like getting increasingly increasingly nasally was actually him being like probably like uber professional and like really wanting to preserve his voice um Mm -hmm. which sort of is an interesting way to look at it because we all as all beach boys fans all wonder like why the hell he got so nasal but it's interesting when you think that that he was a guy that clearly wanted to be performing for the rest of his life. And Mm -hmm. so was trying, was maybe trying to adjust his voice so that he could keep singing, which evidently worked out. (laughs) Right. And like with him, it's like, you know, like his main thing is his vocals, you know, like he's not really a musician. Yeah. Yeah. Vocalist. So like, you know, I feel like I do get that. And it's funny you mentioned that because I just recently learned that like within like the past month or two that like, I read that from maybe it was a forum or something, but somebody said that like, that's why supposedly Mike got more nasally because it's a way to basically makes it easier to sing. I, I have heard like to hit the yeah. higher way of, like you said, keeping your voice uh, in shape. So. But that's yeah, very- Santa Ana wins. Yeah. That's the one moment where his nasaliness has me like, oh. <laughs> but in terms of an Al song, I love it. So great, great yeah. job. So then um, we get to 85. Bracket um, your like we got to go into because i love that yeah song. yeah and i think that song is pretty dope because i think it's the only beach boys song with slap bass i want to say maybe <laughs> slap bass made its way into summer in paradise somewhere i bet but it's kind of like the only beach boys song with like a prominent slap bass part which is kind of cool and it's an uh, al and brian co-write which always results with good stuff yeah um and then a lot of people uh, sort of hate on California Colin, but I, yeah. I, I dig it. Um, I'm a big fan of like the early surf stuff. And so anytime they call back to that, whether it's do it again or any of those, like I, those always like bring a smile to my face. And to me, the fact that Ringo is playing yeah. the drums on it to me, just like instantly makes it like 10 times cooler. And it's also like quite refreshing and like i love drum machine like sound just as much as anybody i think it's like can be a really cool sound when done tastefully which i think Mm -hmm. it is done on 85 but nonetheless it's like really refreshing to get one song on the album that does have like some real drumming by Mm -hmm. ringo star let alone you know um yeah so yeah california collins cool and that's actually another one that i would have assumed was mike and al um but it was actually al and brian so Mm. so i assume brian wrote the music and al wrote the words um or it could have been one of those cases where al kind of just wrote it by himself but they added brian's name on there to to satisfy the label but uh either way i think california Collins is fun yeah no and both of these songs my favorite parts of the songs are al's parts like on crack it's your love like the vote like the i've been keeping my eyes on you you know like i just i love the way he sings it um and i mentioned it's funny you were talking about california calling like how you defend it that song so i used to despise it like i used to think it was like one of the worst songs on 85 but as, as i of- did too as of like very lately it's been growing on me a lot and i was just joking i was just texting riley earlier today that today i was re-listening to it like in preparation for this episode and it's made my beach boys playlist because i just feel like al's chorus is like too catchy for me to not enjoy the song like i just love the like the there's some beautiful women gonna find me Mm -hmm. one it's just it's so memorable and it gets stuck in my head and uh i totally get like why people have a problem with the song like again it feels very like 
like they're really treading in like that nostalgia area. And I get, you said you like that stuff a lot, Nate. So I, I get, you know, I can get why some people dig that, but uh, I don't know. I think the chorus is just too damn catchy. I just, I find it really fun. So I, I don't know. I often like defend this album for like not being overtly nostalgic. Cause a lot of people say it is. And like, this is like one of those. Oh yeah. It's very like, modern and very like forward thinking. Yeah. yeah. But then you got to like get to one of these tracks and it's like, or maybe, <laughs> maybe they are treading that nostalgia thing, but I mean, I don't know. Cause like I, that part alone, like makes me not want to like it, but I mean like at the same time, part of me, like here's that Alvar Al part. And it's just like, that is super damn catch. That is so damn catchy. So I, I might, I I'm in that stage right now where it's growing on me. And I think like, give me like another month and it'll probably, it'll probably be in my beach boys playlist. Um, but yeah, I, 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 crack of your love. Crack of your love is fucking sweet. Yeah. As far yeah. as like the nostalgia thing goes, I I actually made a video on my channel of, uh maybe a month or so ago defending summer in paradise. And mm. basically my my angle on that video was um you know, saying like look, like most of us and most people that love the Beach Boys like fell in love with the the, the silly guys in the striped shirts, <laughs> you know, singing about Barbara Ann and Rhonda. And it's like, you know, just like silly, happy music. And I think like the 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 where rock transitioned into becoming this like very like pseudo intellectual like. I'm too cool for school kind of thing. Like to me, like there's nothing wrong with being the beach boys and just like singing like happy little silly ditties that like remind people of their youth and remind people of their fun that they've had. And so not only that, but also that is like very clearly what the public then and now like wanted from the beach boys. Yeah. And they like, they, proved it with their wallets and i i kind of said like if 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 the audience at large wanted like the super introspective stuff love you would have been like a huge smash hit but if um <laughs> yeah but instead they come and go with me was a big hit and yeah. wipe out and kokomo and just like the fun happy stuff is what what the people want and so you know it's not wrong that the beach boys like eventually recognized like hey like this is yep. what people want from us let's give it to them you know well i and feel so like that, it, that sort of helped me learn to appreciate those albums was like you know like all jobs are customer service basically are trying to make your customers happy and at some point they recognized that that's what was going to make the audience happy and okay yep. i guess that's what we're going to write about you know and I feel like you look at a song, I feel like a great example of that, what you're saying with the public, you know, like leaning into that like kind of music is like, you look at, you know, all those years in the early 70s, all those singles they released, like Long Promise Road and stuff like that, stuff from Holland, and it didn't do much chart wise. But rock and roll music from 15 My number one, one song, exactly. The proof is in the pudding. I mean, to me, that's yeah. a whole transition point where you see like, okay, like, the public wants, you know, songs that remind them of an earlier time, you know, and not like this more progressive stuff they were doing, which again, it's like a double edged, you know, sword or however you want to put mm -hmm. it. It's like, you know, like the band wants to do stuff that's more unique and different and progressive, but then, you know, the public, you have that balance of like, well, this is what the public wants to hear, you know? So it's always, I feel like been something that's been more challenging to the beach boys than like any other band, you know, has had to deal with. So. And for me, that's sort of, I think what I love the most about them and like I love both sides of their coin like equally. Like mm -hmm. I, I'll love uh the old master painter just as much as <laughs> wipe out with the fat boys, you know? Like I can just like love it all and yeah. and like I can like study the intricacies of smile or I can like laugh my ass off and enjoy like you know, giggle at summer of love, you know? So <laughs> like to me it's like so few bands have like that wide range from like extremely serious, progressive, almost like Beethoven level stuff. And right. then like Barbara Ann and Papa Umamao, you know, so that's like really one of the things that made me fall in love with them.
Um, I guess if we want to move on from there, I feel like one other 80s related thing we should mention before we get to like still cruising is that Al was mostly responsible for the band's cover of California Dreamin'. Um, uh, yeah, which is great. Uh, I really love that cover a lot. Um, I think I it used to kind of I used to kind of think like, yeah, it's whatever. But like I've heard it like a lot more recently. I obviously appeared in that one show. I forgot what it was. Was it Stranger Things or one of those shows? Yeah. Made it? And now it's yeah. one of their biggest songs of all time. Like I think yeah. it's their biggest song on Spotify. One of them. Yeah, and I I really like the production on it. I like Al's vocal. I love like the saxophone solo. I know it's like so eighty sounding, but I really do like it. Um, again, does it does it it does it live up to like the original? No, I don't think so. The Mama's the Papa's version, but I think oh, it's. A very- I think it. I think it far so outshines it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Really. I mean, I like the Mamas and Papas version like a little bit more, but like Roger McGuinn on twelve string, like that. That's I know. I have a buddy who's like a diehard Beach Boys fan too, and he always his favorite Beach Boys song is California Dreaming. And one day we're sitting listening to it. I'm like, "Hey, dude, I I have something to tell you." And he's like, "What?" I'm like, "This is a cover." And he's like, "What?" I'm like, "I'm like, yeah, Al Al didn't write this." I'm like, "This is Mamas and the Papas." He's like he was a little disappointed because it was his favorite Beach Boys song, but it, I think there's something as we were saying like Al is a gifted reinterpreter, and and the original California Dreamin' is so like slow and dreamy, mm-hmm. so for Al to turn it into like a new wave rock song <laughs> is yeah. like a stroke of genius, and yeah. then it's sort of like I can sort of draw a parallel in my mind with like the California Girls twelve string intro and the California Dreamin' twelve string intro. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, what a stroke of genius from Al because it was one of their biggest hits of the '80s, and now, like our generation, because of Stranger Things, made it like I think it's like I said, one of their most streamed songs ever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's definitely another moment where Al's shining. Stranger Things needs to um get Kokomo on there, and then Mike Level finally like I know. <laughs> Imagine imagine? They, like, get you, they gotta get like crack at your love on there too that's sick oh we're uh, <laughs> um no then... i feel like what you were saying uh nate about that like i feel like if you told me like okay like take california dreaming and make it into like a 80s new wave kind of like modern sounding yeah. time, i feel like you couldn't have done it any better than al did it just literally it yeah pretty- oh good yeah i mean i was um, the um I think I was also, the, I think I mentioned this in the collaborators episode. Where, um, he was the guy who called up Terry Melcher, and that's kind of how Kokomo got started, too. Oh, Remember that? I had no I, I thought, um, I always just assumed that since Bruce and Terry were like the dynamic duo in the early days, that Bruce was the one that involved Terry. That's cool. I never knew that. Yeah, I, I read know. it in the um, the ESQ article I was I was kind of doing my like notes on for um still cruising with uh terry melcher and uh al called him up while terry was on vacation he's like you do this now or the beach boys aren't going to be involved in the soundtrack at all so he was the one oh wow very cool yeah so terry melcher that brings us to still cruising which um al has really like a, a few cool moments on you've got his original of course island girl uh which um as we were all saying is is a fun sign and i've always seen i always thought that um you know tide is high by blondie dude, yeah. dude i literally said this on one of our episodes yeah, i don't know which one came first oh my but God. i if if island girl oh. came first i would did. oh I blondies was... came first yeah, blondie, so yeah this might be another case of al rewriting something because they're a little too similar i'm surprised no i'm surprised blondie didn't sue actually like that's how I, similar they I, are song probably wasn't popular enough for it to get stirred. true true um, or maybe they were just psyched that the beach boys of all people so you know but yeah, I've made- here regardless it's a even though this is the al episode and stuff we, i got we got to say that carl carl really like elevates island girl to a whole nother level with his vocals <laughs> I went to trinidad i didn't know just what i had so to good <laughs> and then I'll have to double check, but if I, um, does Al, Al does have a, a section on make it big, right? Yeah. It's a uh, baby. Welcome to the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 I love uh, that. Which, yeah. Make it big is, is a lot of fun. And, I love that. um, I, oh, and of course, uh, 
somewhere near Japan. Mm. The he has um probably my like the the vocal highlight of that song, I'd say. Um on the now she's tripping on the Chinese junk, that whole part. Um which is funny because once Al learned what that lyric meant, he refused to ever sing it on stage again. And that's why <laughs> the Beach Boys never played it on stage after that. Um and then that takes us to Summer in Paradise, which is definitely um not a, not a good time for Al because he was suspended from the band during the time they were recording the album. Wasn't it for like attitude um, problems or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> so so I uh I shouldn't really like uh I don't wanna like say anything that would ever like uh yeah, yeah, yeah. come across the wrong way. Mm-hmm. But I do think that Al uh probably could have been a bit of a hard person to be around during that time mm-hmm. um I, mike definitely isn't the only one to to say something along the lines of attitude problems um like i think even even recently and she said it in a very loving way but in a recent carney wilson interview i was watching she was like joking about how grumpy Al can be. And I, I think you can even just sort of see it on his face during the 90s, like during a lot of their like press, like interviews and concerts and stuff. He can yeah. seem like a little checked out and a little annoyed. And we can certainly debate. Like, I think I understand why Al mm-hmm. was becoming frustrated and was mm-hmm. becoming grumpy. Um, He was definitely pro- oldies pro nostalgia act in the 70s and but i think he was having second thoughts by the time the 90s came around yeah yeah and he was probably wanting to return to more of that progressive stuff so maybe it wasn't unjustified but um i have heard a lot of stories from from different people uh just of, of al maybe being like a little hard to be around during that time um, yeah, there not there that interview with him where like he was t- talking about that time? He was like, yeah, it was like turning into a circus because he had like the cheerleaders and and stuff like yeah. that. So, yeah, and I've um, yeah, I've definitely heard some stories. Um, but you know, something else that I love about the Beach Boys is that, um, you know, the Wilson brothers they weren't perfect guys, and everyone everyone has their own million reasons why they think Mike uh, could have been a bit of an ass. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's beautiful. Cause, cause they're all human. They all are a family. They all grew up together and have been doing this for 60 years. And so I don't look at any of them as, as like the heroes or villains and really, you know, they're a family and they're human and they, um, so so yeah, this none of that was me saying that Al is like a bad person. I still think he's really one of the most kind souls of the Beach Boys story. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so during but but you know, during that summer in paradise time, he was probably going through some stuff, going through some disagreements. And so in short, he's basically absent of absent on Summer in Paradise, um, with the exception of finally Mike and Al were able to patch things up for a couple of years for the time being during the end of that record. And so Al did get to add a few lead vocals on um, Strange Things Happen and Island Fever. And I think Strange Things Happen, Al's chorus on Strange Things Happen is probably the highlight of the album for me. Maybe tied with Carl's chorus on Lahaina Aloha. Yeah. Um, Every time I touch my baby strange thing. Dude, so good. I mean, I don't know how anyone can hear that part and not be like, whoa. Like yeah. not not to mention even the fact that the key changes and like the little cool like musical things that are that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but Al's vocal, he just like rips mm-hmm. it and it sounds so good. So so good thing that Mike and Al were able to patch things up so that Al could could lend his voice to the album. Um Love strange things happen. There's a there's a, yeah. there's a couple of like good good tracks on Summer in Paradise. Just the the production that just weighs it down <laughs> so bad. Yeah, and then John yeah. Stamos and, is forever just like weighs it down extra. Like, and, uh, yeah, uh, just pretend it doesn't exist. 
just like I comes tonight. Yeah, I'm, the, the interesting thing too, um, you guys probably know, but if you don't, or if or maybe if the audience doesn't know, is that Summer in Paradise was not one of the first, but literally the first album recorded on Pro Tools, uh, yep. which is the like industry standard recording software, and. So for me, I think that makes like the production like quite forgivable because this is the way that I look at it. So you've got the Beach Boys who at the very beginning were were the crazy geniuses who had the brilliant idea to combine surf music and modern harmony. And then you get to the middle 60s and they like innovated so much with good vibrations and smile and like the different techniques of the recording studio. You get to the 1970s and they're using synthesizers before most of the other bands um, the, and the crazy drums on Do It Again. And basically what I'm saying is they were always guys that were like striving to innovate. And I, I really believe that them using Pro Tools for Summer in Paradise was a continuation of them always trying to be on the cutting edge. And I think the results are clearly mixed. <laughs> um as the production is like very uh like controversial and 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 awkward sounding but for me the fact that even in their what 40s or 50s that they were still trying to like be the most innovative group and like use the newest technology is like hell yeah like these are the same guys that made good vibrations yeah yeah I I can forgive a lot of Summer in Paradise. Besides the John Stamos Forever, I can forgive a lot of it, um, especially with the production yeah. side of it. it. I don't think the production is still good. I think it's bad on a lot of spots, but like, still, it's it's very forgivable. And I mean, I, it gets a lot of hate for being like a basically like a Mike Love like solo project, but I I still really like enjoy it, a lot of it musically, like a lot of the musical like elements of it, like the chord changes and like. Some even some of the like vocal stuff is like really good. It's just some of the drums are too damn loud and production is just not. Yeah, yeah the, the volume of the drums is really like the biggest <laughs> issue. Like everything else sounds not even that bad. Um, and I think part of it's because like it's a 90s album, but it doesn't sound like it's from the 90s. Like if you told me that Summer in Paradise came out in like 1986, I'd be like, yeah, that 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 makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's the fact that like while most of the bands around that time were going to the um much like yeah, steve albini sound. and grunge and yeah like a wait like oasis like i'm, I'm a big like rip yeah. pop guy and like even the stone roses like with second coming went from like this like chorus pedal like guitar driven pop to burr, burr, burr. like that's a lot of the music around the time and then here's the beach boys still doing that like i don't that dated production um mm -hmm. i but i think part of the reason why i can appreciate it now like at least a lot of the stuff that i like on there is because I don't really think about this as an album that came out in 1992. This is just another Beach Boys album trying to like go back to their roots with like the summer songs. Mm -hmm. and I still appreciate. Yeah, a lot I agree. Of For sure, and so... still, still my second least favorite Beach Boys album. But like the the, <laughs> the highs on there, like strange things happen. Um, Lahaina Aloha. I mean, I still crew or still surfing has been growing on me. And Island me Fever. Too. I still really like those songs. I mean, there's actually a UK pressing. Or not pressing, I guess, like a CD copy of it. With um, they, yeah, they it. remixed it. They remixed a lot of it, and like some of it, I actually like like a lot more. Like same. Maybe to me, that's had like Roger the definitive McGuin. version. Maybe it's because maybe it's because of Roger McGuinn, and I'm a big fan of his guitar work. But yeah, it never hurts to have him involved. No, and I guess I would like to add too that um, it's a controversial album. Most people hate it, but one thing I particularly like about Stars and Stripes is uh it's the only beach boys album that you get to hear al and matt singing together on a studio beach boys album and so as far as the jardines go i think that's one aspect that makes stars and stripes like notable and i can only imagine like how proud al must have been to have matt like in in the studio with them for that album because matt was very young i think he was in his 20s when they were making that album and i think it was like maybe um, like just like maybe like just hit 30. yeah yeah so um, I think he was born like late 60s so i think it depends yeah um but yeah so for me that that's one aspect that makes summer i mean stars and stripes noteworthy in al's story 
which um, then leads us to him shortly later uh, leaving the group, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Riley alluded to being um, his way um, of like ha holding integrity and respecting Carl. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I've, I've heard another, I've heard two different stories of, of why that happened. Um, and they're, they're diametrically opposing, which is interesting. So Al claims that he quit the band because of not wanting to play without Carl. But if you read Mike's book, Mike says that when Carl passed away, in the following days, a promoter called Mike and asked if the Beach Boys wanted to do a symphonic tour. Um, and Mike said that it was just too soon to do it without his cousin. Um, and so the promoter called Al next and asked Al if Al wanted to do it. And Al said, yeah, that he would do it without Mike. Um, and so it's interesting that you had that you have Al's story being that he quit because of not wanting to play with Carl. And Mike's story is that he basically fired Al because of how offended he was that Al was so quick to continue. And so probably like the couple other stories we had in this podcast where we, where there were two different stories on how something went down. And the truth was probably somewhere in the middle. Um, I guess most of us will never know. And the truth probably does lay somewhere in the middle of their two stories. But mm -hmm. I, I, that is sort of interesting. Um, and it's weird, though, because Mike played a concert. Mike had no problem playing the Super Bowl a couple of days before Carl passed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Mike and Carl were cousins, so... I can't, if Mike's story is true, I, d I can't understand him being like hurt maybe that Al was willing to proceed within the following few days. Who knows? But, um, but you know, for whatever reason, Al left the group and um, thankfully, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad the Beach Boys continued. Some people don't like that Mike and Bruce continued the band. But fortunately, I think that we've all been blessed to have another 25 years of the Beach Boys. And to me, it would have been like if if they were it called it quits in 98, none of us would have ever been able to see them, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm like extremely glad for that, for Mike and Bruce continuing. Yeah. And I think it's also neat that that now we have multiple versions of the band. And so you have Al starting his his version of the band which was originally supposed to be a another version of the Beach Boys um, until hmm. uh, the, the audiences started asking for refunds, you know, because um, they they do expect Mike Love for better or worse. People go to the Beach Boys and if they don't see Mike up there, they're going to feel gypped, uh, even though some may disagree with that. That's what happened. And so Mike ultimately got the exclusive license and Al had to sort of reconfigure his group into the family and friends which they released a spectacular album which unfortunately isn't on streaming services but uh have you, have you guys been able to check out that family and friends album i know of it i have never listened to it but i do know of its existence is it from like the early is it from like the early 2000s or 99 oh yeah okay if, yeah, yeah. yeah if you need someone to hook you up with it i think i know someone who can wink wink because <laughs> um, it's it's kind of hard to find and it's out of print and stuff but yeah but yeah that's a really really awesome album and i think the family and friends group in general was such a neat idea given that the beach boys are a family band and um it's it's really special that you, you have christian love playing in the beach boys and you have matt jardine um touring with his dad and with brian and so, and plus Carney and Wendy. Mm -hmm. So the family and friends is a really neat group. And I'm, I'm really happy that they 
have reunited in these past couple of years and continued the family and friends band. Um, so yeah, you know, that takes us to the modern day where, or I guess we should mention that's why God made the radio too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and just C C50 in general. So, you know, Al was doing his thing solo, playing a lot of shows with Dean Torrance and David Marks. But as we all know, uh, thank God, uh, 2012 came around and we all found out why God made the radio. And that was to reunite <laughs> the Beach Boys one last time. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, I think Al was like, obviously one of the stars of the 50th reunion. Um, he sort of was like, you know, people always say Carl was like the glue. And I think Al sort of like assumed that role. Sort of like Al and Jeffrey Foskett sort of assumed that role for the 50th tour. Um, because truthfully, by this point, like Al and Mike have made up um, like personally. And so I think Al was sort of like the bridge between the Mike and Bruce camp and the Brian and his band camp for the 50th. And uh, yeah, it was so cool to see Al and David playing the Beach Boy guitar parts together on that tour, you know? Because there were very, very, very few shows where Al and David played together back in the original 60s days. Mm -hmm. So um, to hear those guys playing those iconic guitar parts together was really neat. And then, of course, on um, the record, you've got Al singing on Isn't It Time? Uh, and from there, from and there back to, again. Yeah. And yeah, I think that uh, from there and back again is is certainly one of the highlights of Al's career, no doubt. Mm -hmm. That that song, for me, I've said this before on, on the podcast, to me, that is my vote for the last, like, great Beach Boys song. Like, that song, I just think is phenomenal. It, it Like, it's so moving. I love Al's vocal on it. Um, the lyrics are very like heartfelt and, you know, melancholic kind of reflecting back on the band, you know, and the fact that they've all grown older and like, oh my gosh, that, that song, it's just, it, it it really moves me. And that's, that's one that I, I listen to a lot. It definitely the highlight of that album for me. So Al, Al kills it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the whole, uh, ending suite to me is as good as anything they ever did. Yeah, summer's gone on a Pacific Coast Highway, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the really uh Al's Al's vocals mm. add so much to the entire That's Why God Made the Radio album. Cuz you know, Mike or really not so much Mike, but definitely Brian um his voice had changed a lot and you don't have you no longer have Carl and Dennis in the blend. Yeah. And so Al Al's voice being, you know, practically identical to the way it always sounded really mm -hmm. like made it like, OK, this is that authentic Beach Boys harmony that I'm hearing. It's like the bridge between the past and the present. You know, it's like because like you said, like Brian's Brian's voice had changed so much since then. We're like, you wouldn't necessarily uh, like recognize it from those earlier records, you know, from the 60s. Right. Like Al, it's like when he sings Help Me Rhonda on that tour, it's like that's Al. Like That is. Yeah. Freaking sounds the damn same you know it's incredible so and to this day it's 2024 yeah. so it's been 60 years since al had a vocal his first lead vocal and his voice is still still mm -hmm. beautiful and we did we did touch a little bit on postcards when i had brought up mm -hmm. that in relation to miu but um we should talk about that a little bit more too um yeah yeah i love for me, I'm, if I'm just thinking about that album off the top of my head, I think, I think "Don't Fight the Sea" is like a stone cold oh. classic. Oh, I agree, man. Like yeah. to me, that's just like a, it gives me chills, like total chills when I listen to that song. Yes, I love you know, how the, Carl, Carl's on there too. You know, like you have like yeah, that, yeah. When, when, the whole old, band, the whole band is on there. When were they originally working on that song? Like, how old is 15 that? Fifteen big ones. Really. Yeah, and believe it or wow. not, you got Eddie, you got Eddie Carter on the bass, and wow. Bobby Figueroa on the drums. Like all the instruments, with the exception of uh, some of the like 
2012 wobble bass that they added in like the chorus <laughs> is yeah. almost all from the 15 big ones era. I would never have guessed that. I would have guessed it was like 80s, like mid early 80s, maybe yeah. later and 80s. The, but then the the boys, um, you know, the 75 year old boys um, added their vocals all. I think that was like one of their dipping the toes in the water for for the 50th, basically, because yeah. it was the year prior. Um, and I love the version of California Dreamin' on there, too. With Glenn. With Glenn Campbell. Yeah. yeah. And um, Stamos is actually on there, too. Stamos is the percussionist on that mm. California Dreamin'. I was just going to say, like, the, I actually prefer this version of California Feeling over any of the other ones. I like this one the best. Yeah, it's it's like so comforting to listen to that that yeah. song. Yeah. Uh, I also really like Waves of Love, which also has a Carl part. Which on of it. the hundred versions? Well, um, I would <laughs> say the, the one that's on like the basic album. Like if you pull it, yeah, up, yeah, like the yeah. I just love Carl. Like the, I'm riding on the waves of love. It's like so nice to hear Carl again. You know, it's really great. I know, and that's another one that was done. 15 big ones era wow that um, one too yeah i listened to postcards today to like get my mind ready for this episode and yeah i love when carl pops up on on that <laughs> album and yeah and yeah you got brian on there too and bruce and yeah the whole gang it's I amazing love when i love when mike says um on the when when al goes i looked at the polar bear something like that and mike goes she said you know the on "Don't Fight the Sea." I love that part. <laughs> no, I it, it's crazy too how many people are featured on that album because you have Glenn Campbell, you have I know Neil Young, David Crosby, and I think Stephen Stills on the California Saga, uh, California version on there. Uh, you have some of the guys from America on there. I think on the song, I think it's what is it, San Simeon? I think the guys yeah. from America on there. It's like there's so many people featured on there, which I think says a lot about like how many like connections Al has and like. The fact that like he's a genuinely good guy, you know, that he's so close with a lot of these great musicians, you know, says a lot about him, I feel like. Yeah, you know, to me, totally like you said, like, you know, these the all the 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 guys that are feature on that album are clearly so famous and successful that they don't need to do mm -hmm. that. But but yeah. that Al must be like, you know, such a good guy that they're like, Yeah, of course I'll come down to your studio yeah. that's inside of a barn and record with you you know all these legends you yeah. even had mccartney do his little shout out the don't fight the sea for the video i don't even know if i knew that really yeah so so um they did a music video for don't fight the sea uh -huh. and at the end paul mccartney look points at the camera and says don't fight the sea as like a favor I, oh that my... he did for al wow i don't know how yeah. i missed I don't give yeah. that oh my gosh um i feel like we should also mention the title track is really good on this album a postcard from california with uh, i think glenn campbell's on that as well yeah. I was listening to an interview with al earlier today just because i wanted to just you know just like listen to a couple of things al had said over the years and it's a recent interview from i think uh 2022 maybe or late 2021 um but al was saying how um they were like you know they were reissuing postcard from california and he said how when he would perform that song at like some of his concerts, like his uh, with like the family with like um, mm. with uh, his son, with Matt and, and the family and stuff, uh, people would recognize that song and like sing along with it. And Al was like blown yeah. away. But I think it says a lot about the quality of that song. That, like people like recognized it when Al performed it, you know. Totally. I I have to say, um, you know, also knowing knowing that it was about his like dad and his childhood sort of like it's very like autobiographical mm -hmm. and um knowing that it was about glenn or that glenn was on there um mm -hmm. who was al's bandmate you know for three right. four months yeah and just like all of those different aspects um when i heard him sing that in concert a couple years ago i definitely got choked up because it was yeah. like wow like sort of like the the bow on a beautiful life, you know, not to be like morbid or anything, but like, yeah, it's definitely like him, like looking back on his story with love. Um, yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, looking back with love. Um, 
Oh my and yeah, God. so I, I, I did. I love that that song. Yeah, I remember when he was singing. He did it live when I saw him too uh, last summer, and I remember like we were all like singing along the chorus. It was it was fun. It was nice. And yeah. then his son Matthew does like the most killer Glenn Campbell impression on <laughs> Glenn's part of the song, which like no one knew that he could do. Because Matt normally sings all the like falsetto parts, so to hear yeah. him do like the low country voice is so funny. No, I was I was just gonna say like uh, talking about Matt, like it's amazing how like how you know you're talking about how like it runs in the family genes, you know, like the vocals, yeah. like Matt, like oh my god, like his voice is just incredible, like it's amazing how versatile, like all the different parts he can sing, and um, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've heard it, Nate, but like on the Sail and Sailor box set, they have that live version of All This Is That from '93. And Matt's, yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt's, I, I always thought originally, I thought that that was Carl doing the higher part at the end, like the Jay Guru Dev. And then later I found out that's actually Matt doing that. And I was like, wow, like, damn, Matt sounds good on that. You know, so it's just, he's amazing. I know you got Matt and uh, Al's sons, Drew and Adam both sing too. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you got Christian and the Beach Boys and you've got Carney and Wendy. Yeah. And um, even Brian's granddaughter, L Lola Bonfiglio, sings now, and she's going to mm -hmm. college for music. And it's amazing that it's continued to be a family hobby and tradition and career for them. And I think I think even hasn't uh, one or two of uh, our, of Carl's sons also or kids also appeared on like a couple of things. Like they did like yeah. a couple like union performances with them too, which is really cool. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I believe Jonah is a singer too yeah when he was doing that california saga thing with them on the reunion tour yeah it's really cool yeah. you know hearing that you know jonah on a uh, trader with the high and it's like you know yeah you're, it's, it's, i know so and now as an adult yeah yeah what were you gonna say oh, yeah. uh right oh i was gonna say when i uh so I, I i wanted a vinyl copy of this album of postcard to california so i emailed them and they um they said oh we're kind of like we don't have any right now but we'll let you know if you do and um, they, they emailed me like a week later, like we had one in stock if you want. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. And um, so I paid, um, I think I like Venmo or like sent the guy the money and he sent it to me. And yeah. it came with a postcard from Al Jardine signed. And not only right. is it like just his signature, but it says to Riley, best wishes, Al Jardine. And it's just like oh, man. personalized to me. And it's one of those things that's like, damn, this guy, this guy's just like really damn nice. And actually, I didn't know this until I was checking this out. Came with a signed picture too. So, oh my gosh, I, I like figured that out. Classic like big Al guitar, yeah. That's so cool, man. I love that. So I'm telling. Yeah, so I, you know, I guess we've we've gotten fully to the modern day, and I, I feel like an amazing. It was the way we started. And the way to sort of wrap things up too is just like I think with what he did for you, Riley, with that, you know, sending you the album signed and personalized and everything. He's just the nicest normal guy that happens to be a famous rock star, you know? And that's like what's made Al so special for all these years. Right. Yeah, I mean, they pretty much summed it up. He just seems like such a down to earth and chill guy. Like I'd love to like just like sit down with him somewhere and just like, you know, have a drink and just talk about music for an hour. You know, he just seems like such a down to earth and relatable guy. And I, I just love that about him. And he obviously some incredible contributions to the beach boys albums, obviously the live band. Um, I guess before we wrap up here, guys, uh, just real quick, I just wanted to uh, kind of go over this. So uh, do you guys have any favorite either Al vocals or Al co-writes or just or, or original compositions? Like, do you guys have like a top two or three songs you want to you want to shout out or mention if you um, had to pick? I I want to say Help Me Rhonda is my top 10 Beach Boys songs. So, I mean, that's one of my mm -hmm. favorite Al vocals. I really like the specifically the get her out of my heart. That part, like always that's that's like clicked with me since I was a kid. Um, The yep. whole California saga. I mean, I know Mike wrote Big Sur, but. The whole the whole thing is like is my second favorite Beach Boys song of all time. If you like put everything together, I mean, I mentioned I I really like the Beaks of Eagles. I even like that spoken word bit. Um, the, the Cali California or like the last part of the saga, like is such like a groovy song. Like the bass line is so cool, and just uh, the vocal delivery is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Those those are the two I can really think of off the, off the top of my head. I mean, I do like Postcard from California. I think that's. It, I think next to um, Pacific Ocean Blue, it, it might be my favorite Beach Boys solo album. I, re I really like 
the the whole vibe of it. I really like the little like snippets, like the campfire scene, and all the things he adds to that that kind of like make the whole album like special and very unique. But um, Mm hmm really like the California Saga helped me, Rhonda. I mean, pretty much any Al vocal. I mean, it's just reliable. I mean, it's you kind of know what to expect. It's just like a rocking, killer vocal from Al, and he he has a golden voice. And he's kind of carried to the
And so to like be at the show where his friends were like coming to support him after all these years, it was it was like so special. That And is so. um, he's like, he's like, we're going to play a song now. I'm not sure if many of you know it. Santa Ana wins. And I was like, Woohoo! <laughs> and I was like the only one in the bar who knew it. And like everyone like looked Did at he... me. Did he do the little the um the spoken word intro? Did he say like in they're in California? Yeah, so yeah. he did that. He did. Yep. Yeah. Are and you then serious? Also, That's sick yeah. as fuck. And then also, um, he was like, "Okay, um, next we're gonna play this uh song from Pet Sounds. I don't remember. It was probably God Only Knows or something." And he's yeah. like, "This is one that Brian wrote with Van Dyke Parks," and I was like, <laughs> "Tony Asher? No, it was Tony Asher." <laughs> and Matt was like. Thank you. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff I want to. I that's exactly why I wanted to come to the East Coast. I'm I'm sure yeah. he might get around. I I like I scout like every like three or so months. Like, is Al gonna be playing in a uh, Boston or whatever? Because that's like the only spot I feel like he probably would. And uh, I know this is ridiculous, but I I I'll admit I check I check Mike and Al's like tour schedule like every day. It's part of my routine. <laughs> uh riley uh, now you're gonna have like, like a brush the teeth eat breakfast check the beach boys tour tour schedule right <laughs> riley you're gonna have a dream at night that uh you're gonna you're like in a bar somewhere and uh, alice performing he's like all right some of you guys i don't know if any of you guys are gonna know this one it's a little song called crack at your love and yeah. riley's, yeah. riley's like steve yeah levine. he gets like steve levine with a drum machine drum machine out of yeah. nowhere and he's, and he's like dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. that would be <laughs> that that's one I would record. Like that, I would be I would be totally. so excited if I saw that. Like I don't, I generally don't like recording at concerts. But if he pulled out "Crack at Your Love," I'm I'm getting that. Like I'm gonna Man. like start a mosh pit to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think when I saw him, I think the only thing I filmed, you know, it's 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 almost even more awkward to film at like an Al show than a Mike show when you're like in this like little small bar. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and mine was like it was kind of like a steakhouse almost that he was performing in so it was like they didn't even want people to film but um i had to just get a little snippet of him doing the ding 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 yeah ding, ding. i think we forgot to I'm mention like, that he I'm usually like, does the intro right yeah so um so yeah to, to, to catch al playing that and you know he always plays it but when it's just him playing it you know yeah and just just the sound of his guitar like filling the room that was like a magical moment too I think I've seen like pictures of him playing like stand up bass at his shows too. Yeah, because they do surfing, and so he plays the stand up on that, and then they normally do surfs up too, and he plays the stand up on there. Oh shit! And, hey, um, um, Nate, you know you were saying that moment where you yelled out, San "You were like, yeah, with the Santa Ana winds, and nobody knew." Yeah. Kind of me, I felt like when I saw him last year at like this outdoor thing, and uh, he said, "Because I I didn't look at the set list because I didn't want to spoil it for myself." And he was mm -hmm. like, now we're going to do surfs up. And I was like, yeah, you know, I was like, woo, you know, and like, I only heard like one other person say anything. Everyone yeah. else was like silent. I was like, oh, this, this is not, you know, this is definitely the casual crowd. <laughs> <laughs> the diamond necklace played the song. I know people were probably that, you know, people were like, huh? You're like, what is this? <laughs> oh, Man, you know, if, if if Al if Al took requests like at his shows, I'd be like, oh, this is that. Come on, man. All Crack at your love. <laughs> there you go crack at your love for riley all this is that for me that oh my god you, you have no idea how excited i'd be to see him like anybody perform crack at your love live but like al jardine like the shit that would <laughs> i think i would faint like no joke i think i would faint it's like beethoven hearing beethoven play you know his fifth or hearing al sing crack at your love oh <laughs> <laughs> i guess the one other thing i was going to add about al um i might even share if it has to be said Mm -hmm. it's pretty obvious but i think he really is quite the family man um i know that uh marianne his wife his current wife like uh tours with him and like goes to all the shows and he has uh all of his sons like involved with the music and it's cool a lot of a lot of rockers a lot of faults that a, a, a fault that is shared among many rockers is not being great family men and it's amazing how well it seems al was able to balance his his rock star life and his family life 
And that might be above all, like the most commendable thing about him. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something uh, relating to that, you mentioned his 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 wife. What's her name? Marianne. You said. Yeah. That's correct. Um, something interesting with that. So the interview I was listening to earlier um, today, he he was talking about his about Marianne, and he said that she actually like growing up, she was actually more into the band's early seventies stuff. He said like she grew up yeah. listening, like uh, like we more must have been listening to the same interview today because I I was oh, listening really? to that same interview. Yeah. yeah. It was like I was like, oh damn, that's really cool, you know, like that she did. That was what she was I, initially familiar with. I had no idea that a fan like that could, could honestly even like exist. Like I feel <laughs> like if you're an American, I feel like Surfing USA and Help Me Rhonda and Barbara Ann are just like built into our DNA. Right. So to picture someone that only knows like Holland and like Love You, let's say, you know, and yeah. like is more familiar with that stuff than like the hits is like definitely so, was like a trip to me hard to even fathom yeah no, that's amazing i love that um uh, i wanted to quickly i think i mentioned this before like about the guitar playing but like every day like when i do like the um kind of think if i'm ever like playing along i i like the i immediately just like think of the al technique like i don't know like why al jardine is the one who like influenced that kind of guitar style with me but <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that, dude, because I had the exact same experience. Um, I love the Beatles and, and Kurt Cobain and like tons of bands. But Al is like my guitar idol. And um, for me, like when I was picking up the guitar, my whole goal was to be able to do what Al does. And I have really no desire to go beyond like what Al does. Like I wanted to be able to play rhythm guitar just like Al. And since you were showing like what you learned from him, I, I do kind of want to show like one thing that I sort of picked up from him. As I'm sure you know, it's like kind of standard to play your bar chords with your index barring. Um, and often to, you know, use your ring finger to bar the other strings when you're in this position. But what I've noticed is Al emits the E strings and does like this type of shape for bar chords yeah um almost like an f shape but moving around the neck and i was like oh like you know that's cool you don't really need the low e especially if there's a bass so and you can just play for hours and hours just you know doing this motion uh, my hands get really sore like this but like this i can go all day I, and the I, other thing um oh yeah you can go i was just gonna say i generally play bar chords the same way but i do include that high e string so i didn't know about that i um Oh, well, yeah, the high E, too. Yeah, yeah, I think he does um, still get that high E string, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm very... Like even a... I've noticed I've noticed him when they do, like, Help Me Rhonda, which has, like, a, the G over the F chord. He'll, like, get that G with his thumb like this. Oh, that works. Um, yeah, so different things. Uh, yeah, like that. Like, Al is no Hendrix. He's not even a, a Carl in terms of, like, riffing and soloing and stuff but he's like like the definition of like a, a solid rhythm guitarist he's like a ringo style guitarist like he he, he does totally he totally and so yeah to me i was like my my guitar god that i've always like looked up to jake's like what the fuck are they talking about <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm I, I get some of it all right, do we want to wrap it up there, guys? Perfect. All right. And let me just say too, I guess before it's it's technically wrapped, uh thank you so much, Jake and Riley, for like including me. It was an honor to talk to you guys and to your audience. And I hope to be a part of more episodes. This was great. So thank you so much. Of course, man. You're welcome to join us again, like anytime. Like we'd love to have you on for like another one of these like member spotlight episodes. I feel like you do a really great job of like kind of like carrying us through the history, and you're obviously so knowledgeable about this band. I know that from watching your uh, <laughs> former podcast you were on. So you're welcome to join us anytime, man. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for listening to this 14th episode of Good Timing. I hope you all enjoyed the show. I had a really great time talking with both of you guys about Al's life and musical career, and I'm looking forward to doing more Beach Boys member spotlights in the future. So uh, also, it was great having you on the show, Nate. I feel like I learned quite a bit from you today, and I hope all of our listeners learned something new as well. So 
As always, if you like this podcast and want to hear more, feel free to subscribe or follow wherever you're listening. Uh, we greatly appreciate the support as it motivates us to make more episodes in the future. Uh, also, as a reminder, the podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So there are plenty of different ways to listen and keep up with the show. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for listening, and we will see you all next time. Bye-bye.